Trinity County Board of Supervisors meeting a regular meeting for September 19th, 2017. Welcome everyone and good morning. And I will read in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the pledge. are limited to three minutes and must pertain to matters within the jurisdiction of this board. When addressing the board, please state your name for the record and, uh, and address the board as a whole through the chair. No action or discussion will be conducted on matters not listed on the agenda. However, the chair may refer the subject matter to the appropriate department for follow-up or schedule the matter for a subsequent board agenda. Is there any public comment today on items not on the agenda? Good morning, Liz McIntosh, Junction City. Um, at our last meeting, I believe, Chairman Fenley, you mentioned that there, that uh, County Council Long, as well as Director Tippett, were going to start working on ag exemptions. And I was hoping that maybe we could agendize a conversation with Commissioner Dolph. I know there's lots of questions about liability and that kind of thing, and most of the things that we have presented throughout this process have been uh, in line with the same things that he's recommended over in Humboldt County. So maybe he could shed light. And as we saw this year, it's by the time we get February, March, it's a little late to have people implementing things. So if that could happen, and then also, um, maybe a, a conversation or an agendized item for declaring a contact person under SB 94, which I would hope would be the planning department or cannabis department, whomever ends up in that capacity. But if we could have a conversation agendized on that would be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good morning, thank you. Yeah, my name's Josh Bose, and uh, I don't want to play any violins for anybody, but I have terminal stage cancer. And the only thing that's kept, uh, kept me alive is this plant. Now, I noticed something in here that interested me today, and it was the, the idea that, that you wanted to regulate uh, the dispensary of cannabis products, and that means no commercial in certain areas. Okay. Now, I, I, will, this, will this be on the agenda today? No, I don't think so. We're discussing um, our cannabis ordinance. Oh, oh, oh. I, I, I was going to talk about mar uh, medical marijuana use. Is that in the same category? Should I sit down? Uh, yeah, why don't you save it until our 10 a.m.? Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Harvey Weaverville again. Um, what I wanted to bring up first was the matter of the CAO. Uh, it's, it's been quite some time that this position has been open and there has been supposedly some active recruiting going on. And yet we know nothing, or I know nothing. Uh, I don't know if people have been applying for the jobs, if you've been interviewing them. We do see closed sessions that sometimes indicate that maybe you're dealing with the, filling the CAO position. Uh, having a good CAO officer would do tremendous things for the county. For one thing, it would eliminate the micromanaging you guys have to do. And I wonder why doesn't a CAO come? Uh, if it's strictly salary, it's certainly true that looking at CAO salaries the county can afford it, particularly with this boost in budget that's come in this recent year. So I don't think it's necessarily salary. It has something else to do. Uh, maybe it's moving costs. You know, maybe moving someone in from somewhere else. Uh, maybe it's the schools. Uh, maybe it's the living conditions. Uh, some people like to move here for fishing and things like that. Fishing is going to crap. So uh, maybe it has to do with public safety. Maybe they're a little afraid of coming here. Uh, certainly, 
recently, I don't know if you saw it on the news or read about it, Siskiyou County was in the news as requesting outside help for their current lawless situation. And uh, even requesting from the governor a state of emergency and requesting help from outside agencies such as Fish and Wildlife, the <coughs> National Guard. Um, it's interesting that at the end of uh, KRCR's TV snippets on this thing, they mentioned, well, it sounds a little like Trinity County. Uh, I think we need to pay some attention to not assuming that things are going to get better just if we go along the road we've been going on for quite some time. I think something active needs to be done instead of just sort of saying, oh, we're going to get more money, we're going to have a better economy, we're going to be better, better, better. And it's not happening. It takes some activity. Thank you. Thank you. Thoughts on that? A bad example was writing a shaming letter to the various agencies that uh, we asked would have to ask for help from. I think that's a horrible mistake. Thank you. Any other public comment? Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, Tom Belenko, Douglas C. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, in the prison population in the United States, uh, that the prevalence of HIV infection is five times the general population. Um, this is attributed in many cases to the fact that the people that find themselves in prison are often the kinds of people that are in a higher risk group for HIV. But according to the CDC, World Health Organization, and Human Rights Watch, among other organizations, the main reason is because the Federal Bureau of Prisons doesn't allow condoms in prison because sex among prisoners is illegal. Uh, California, to its credit, is one of four states that does allow condoms in prison. Uh, why am I talking about this? Well, as, uh, as the morning mist uh, begins to point to the end of fire season, uh, and we start to look at our after actions for how we as a county treat what is increasingly our annual uh, severe wildfires, um, we've got to understand in the Bureau of Prisons, there's a place where our regulations and reality don't meet. And that's in our evacuation procedures. And I, I'll call the people that stay behind the fire militia. Uh, certainly it happened in Junction City in the last several weeks, happening at least in Trinity Pines in the la and in Denny in 2015. People who were supposed to evacuate but chose to stay behind uh, became firefighters themselves. In many cases, uh, they stayed behind with gasoline and water smuggled into them. They ran pumps that saved homes. I know our public safety agencies are mostly concerned with public safety. Uh, at the same time, I know there's always going to be people that choose to risk their safety to protect their homes. So as we discuss that as a county and you as a board, Perhaps we can investigate some procedures where for these people who knowingly choose to stay behind, we can make provisions to make their uh, time behind the evacuation lines more sustainable uh, so that they can help. Uh, and, and I know some of the agencies may think that help is actually a hindrance, but at least let's have a conversation about that. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you, John. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the board. We're going to move on to presentations from the Board of Supervisors 1.1. Receive an update regarding the Helena fire and recovery operations. There's no fiscal impact. And 
Judy, would you like to uh, lead off with this? Sure. Thank you, Chair. See if there's anyone here. Um, anyone from Fire today? No. Oh, did I see no. Um, anyone from Recovery, Rick or Letty, that wants has a little bit of a snippet that you want to share? If not, that's okay. Sure. Um, Levy Garza, Health and Human Services. Um, recovery efforts are beginning. Um, we have the state OES coming this week to start the initiation of debris removal. Um, they will be setting up an office next to the Ace Hardware so that the homeowners can go in and, and check in with questions or information on resources. So we're can just continuing to work closely with them to get that started, and uh, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Right. Okay. Betty, is there an announcement for Thursday night at six o'clock? Yes, there is a another public meeting in Junction City Elementary School. Um, that meeting will be specifically for debris removal information. So everyone who has a home affected should be should hopefully will attend to get information on the process. The, the state. Debris removal will be there. Cal Recycle will be there to address any questions or concerns. So, okay. Thank you, Lenny. Mm -hmm. And that's it for today's update. We're going to move on to the next presentation, 1.2. Receive a presentation from Lonnie Block, Regional Coordinator, with the Planning and Service Area Agency, Area 2 Area Agency on Aging regarding the Long Term Care Alms Budman Program. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. My name is Lonnie Golick. I am the regional coordinator for the on and services for five counties uh, in Northern California. Um, what we do is we seek to resolve <coughs> problems and we advocate for the rights of residents in skilled nursing and residential care facilities. We this is new for me. <laughs> Um, it's the level of care, we give facility information, placement information, uh, admission agreements. We mostly deal with elder abuse, neglect, financial exploitation, the quality of care, residence rights, Medi-Cal, Medicare, uh, planning, community presentations, we do health care directive, resident rights. We need to know about our seniors and what's going on when, unfortunately, they need to go into, especially a skilled nursing facility. Um, we have five counties. It's Lassen, Modoc, Shasta, Siskiyou, and Trinity. We have two and a half paid staff now and six volunteers. They receive 36 hours of classroom training, 10 hours of internship, before they're certified by the California Department of Aging. Um, they get 12 hours of ongoing training each year to remain certified. We have 15 skilled nursing facilities and 51 residential cares that we oversee for the elderly. We serve 2,500 residents in our five counties. We are a resident-based advocate which means that the resident has the last say on their care and what's right for them, um, even if it, it sometimes is wrong for them. And we do advocate for that. We work with local law enforcement, adult protection services, public guardian, mental health, Department of Justice, licensing agencies that all oversee the regulations for the facilities. We oversee the residents' right that possibly could have been violated in that regulation. We are funded by the federal and state dollars, monitor conditions of the facilities. We uh, educate residents and the community. The community needs to know about our program. 
because unfortunately, if for some reason, between the age of 18 and 116, someone may eventually be in a skilled nursing facility and they have to know that what they're being told in a facility is correct. Sometimes it's not. Hospitals are the same. When a person is removed from a hospital, they go into a skilled, then unfortunately, not everything's great. That's not a secret to anyone. Um, the types of complaint that we have, mostly I would say food, maybe staffing issues, uh, the family dynamics, family conflicts, once grandma's in a facility, all of a sudden all of grandma's things are taken over and all of a sudden the state or federal is paying for grandma to stay there. So we have a lot of financial. We work with um, banking institutes to make sure that the financial aspect of this person's financial um, assets are taken care of. So this is what we do. Our main concern is it's very difficult when you have 2,500 residents and five volunteers. So needless to say, being a regional coordinator, what I do is I oversee the ombudsman. If we don't have an ombudsman for an area, then it's my job to cover that area. So I cover a lot, between one and 2,000 miles a month doing so. Um, so we are in need of volunteers. It's a wonderful job that, that we do, that the, uh, your community, um, and I think that's <coughs> it for us. How many, how many volunteers are there in Trinity County? Just me. Okay. Thank you very much. You're uh, welcome. You said that you are state and federally funded. Are those through grant writing funds? Or it's from the Old American Act. Um, the Old so American a Act. portion okay. of it, a lot of what we do, um, we do accept donations. <coughs> Usually it's for mileage and, and things for um, the volunteers that, that go out and do travel a lot. I am now, I've been an ombudsman. It'll be I start my 10 years in December, and the last four, I have been on and off employed. And unfortunately, when the state says, oh, got to cut something, it's usually our program. And, and you are state mandated? We are state mandated, state and federal. Okay, so state. you have, so we are, have to exist. Yes, we are a federal oversight agency to protect the, the rights of people in especially skilled nursing facilities. Do you have anybody up here who assists in um, applications for Medicare? Uh, our HICAP. HICAP, okay. HICAP is also with our PSA program um, that deal with that. And please remember, folks, <laughs> in the next couple of years, your Medicare card is going to change and there will be no Social Security number on your card so please do not forget that and you're going to have a lot of people calling you that shouldn't be calling you to tell you what they have to offer Lonnie, i'm almost there so i'll, I'll watch out <laughs> well i've been passing so okay. way passive. <laughs> uh, anything else um oh, I think that's okay it. you do a great job did the board have any questions Lonnie, I think I uh, understand that you helped um, a lot when our skilled nursing center was in a little bit of state of transition temporarily last year. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you for your help. <laughs> <laughs> what happened when people were displaced on that temporary closure? We wound up with, I think it was 15 residents in the skilled and then seven or eight in the um, swing unit, which we also, that is our jurisdiction above um, APS. For California, in your skilled nursing, the ombudsman oversees, but we work extremely well with APS, so it's, you know, a combination of 
but when it was such a short notice for these folks, um, no facility would take them. All we had was people going to um, Riverside, California, San Bernardino, and so I have a very good rapport with facilities. I'm ornery, I'm not so nice, I will shoot you in the face with a bazooka if you mess with a resident. We have an opening over here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but my, <coughs> that was not acceptable to me, absolutely not. So because I work well with, and please, it's with facilities, <laughs> not for, because we are resident-based, um, I placed all but two in our area, in Shasta County and uh, Siskiyou. So I'm really kind of, you know, mm -hmm. proud of that. And I'm proud of our facilities for, you know, taking into consideration the issue from the distance that these people would have had to go. Okay, thank, thank you for that. I have a constituent uh, down in District 5 that thanks you also. They're very, you. very helpful. Any thank other you. questions? Okay, thank you, Lonnie. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to item 1.3, receive a presentation from Martin Dielbach, uh, Chief Marketing Officer with the Coast to Coast RX program regarding the Coast to Coast RX program, no fiscal impact. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Board Chair Penley and Board members. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about our program. Uh, the Coast to Coast RX card, uh, its first county in California, was back in uh, 2008, the Ventura County Board of uh, endorsed us. Uh, in 2011, we had 11 uh, uh, counties in the state when the CSAC board uh, decided to endorse us. Uh, now we have 34 counties in the program, and the most recent are nearby counties of Shasta and Glen in July. Uh, they launched the program. What is the program? The program is a free discount prescription card that uh, is available to anybody with a valid prescription. So whether they're insured or uninsured or uh, even undocumented persons can, if they have a, a, a valid prescription, they can go ahead and use this card. They can use it at both the pharmacies here in the county. Uh, they can use it when they're traveling. Uh, there are 60,000 pharmacies in the program nationally, so it's virtually any chain, every chain pharmacy and about 95% of the independents are included in the network. So what, what does the card do for the county? We pay $1.25 uh, for every paid prescription, uh, and that's a royalty to the county. Uh, that does not increase cardholder costs. Basically, it's a marketing fee paid to our company by pharmacies, just like they advertise or market their services elsewhere. They're marketing through us to drive in business and create loyalty with uh, the residents that use the card. Uh, the card covers 60,000 different NDC codes, or virtually every drug in, available in the marketplace is included in this uh, program. <coughs> Right now, our, our uh, cardholders in the 34 counties are saving over $4 million a month in, in California. Um, nationwide, we're about 23 million. So California is about one-sixth of our uh, savings in the nation. Um, the card's great, again, for uninsured or insureds that don't have a particular drug covered under their health plan. And that's increasing the number of uh, drugs that are not in a health plan formulary because employers are deciding that the uh, burden should be uh, borne by employees more so than themselves as drug costs increase. So anybody, again, that doesn't have a drug covered under their health plan or even if they have a, let's say, a, a $20 copay, oftentimes our card uh, pricing might be $10, $15 for that same drug. So it can help people with their out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, people in uh, Medicare Part D, if they don't get a supplemental program, sometimes uh, when they're in the donut hole, they could use the, the discount card to save. Well, this isn't a cure-all of certainly uh, of all uh, health issues in a county. It, it's just a part of the puzzle. And uh, we 
you know, look forward to working with uh, the board and hope that the matter will be agendized in the future, uh, in the near future, so that uh, Trinity can, be can become the 35th county in the state. Uh, we're very close on about another 10 counties in the state, and our goal ultimately is to get all 58 counties in this program. It's sort of a win-win situation. There's no, absolutely no cost to the county. We do all the distribution and marketing of the program. Uh, the county uh, just receives a monthly <coughs> report and a royalty check, so it's, it's uh, uh, a great value. For example, in Amador County, uh, we started in 2010, and the uh, uh, royalties that we paid were something like 15 or 20,000 a year to them. Uh, ended up being uh, uh, used for senior citizen program, their mobile meals on wheels program. In San Diego County, they use it to fight child uh, children obesity. Uh, and I'm not saying that you know one, ten, or a hundred people will use it in Trinity uh, a month. Or uh, it, the idea is just to have this available so that anybody that is in need can use can use the program. And uh, the card not only services uh, humans, uh, it also services uh, pet prescriptions. So any pet prescription that is available for human consumption uh, can be, uh, the card can be used. I've used it, I have uh, four dogs, and oftentimes uh, we've been able to use the card to uh, save money instead of getting them at the higher price and cost veterinary. Um, besides the discount prescription card, this actually has six other uh, medical discounted benefits. It includes discounts on dental, vision, even veterinary services, lab and imaging, diabetes supplies and equipment. So it's a, a well-rounded discounted medical program at absolutely no cost to uh, the residents and anybody traveling through the county. And the great thing about the card itself, there is a code on the card so that when it is used, whether it's used if someone goes to Arizona, the state of Washington, or Oregon. Whenever they use this at a pharmacy, the code relates back to Trinity, and you would receive the royalty for that card. So basically, uh, it's a great uh, program. Again, it's not a cure-all, but it's something that we hope that the board will uh, move forward with, and, uh, and hopefully soon, and uh, open for questions if you have any. Board, any questions? Um, have a request for public to go, um, go ahead and sit down. I'd like to open this up to the public to see if they have any questions or actually comments I'd prefer regarding this item. Okay, Grace from Lewiston. Um, this is very similar to last year when we had someone from actually two different people from, I'm not sure if they met you through RCRC or CSAT come and give us a presentation which basically would have put us in a, a, a cog, a Riverside cog, where they were a private company setting up something where they worked it through the county, and that's what this is. It's, a, it's another situation where um, I'm guessing they're private, and I have no idea how they can properly come through a government uh, body to do this. Um, basically what they do, because these guys make a profit, they're not volunteering, So, and the county gets a cut, why would the county get a cut? Um, if it's a great program, you should just do it. Um, the, the free card, anyone can get it. You can go online, even if you guys don't get into this program, you can still go online and get a card. Basically what they do, the program administrator may obtain fees or rebates from manufacturers and or pharmacies based on your prescription drug purchases. So what they do is the um, pharmacies and manufacturers are basically forced to accept these cards. They're not going to not pass on the price. So if you do get a discount on these services, you're just passing it on to somebody who doesn't because they're going to make up the money somewhere. Also, this is highly connected to the huge leaps and bounds that have happened with prescription drugs and things like EpiPens and insulin prices. And if you want to see the correlation, go look at the drugs that have gone up by leaps and bounds hugely in weeks and see if they're covered under these plans. Because there's a direct effect for doing this. This isn't a no effect. And um, if you guys consider doing this, I, I strongly um, am against it. There's no reason for you to support it. 
the people can do it on their own if they choose. And to me, it's one of those things with hidden consequences where it sounds good and there's lots of consequences to it and the only one who gets rich is the middleman. Um, the people get some cuts on their medication, the companies pass it on to the other people who don't, and the middleman makes a buck. And that's not right. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Is there any other public comment? This isn't a back and forth response or, or anything. Thank you. Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the board. Um, board members, any questions? Uh, Bobby, you brought this forward. Is yeah. there something you'd like to proceed with? Or? Uh, I would like to know what the, how the board wants to proceed and how, how the public would like to proceed. I heard from Kay, but I, I want to appreciate Martin for, for coming because they stopped doing presentations a long time ago, and he came a long way just to, to do this, so I really do appreciate it. Okay. I, I have no interest in moving forward with this. Is, do you want a board consensus? Or? Yes. Okay, do you have an interest in moving forward? Yes. Okay. What exactly does that it would mean? Yeah. It would be required uh, board action in the future with a resolution. Wouldn't this, wouldn't we bring in Health and, HHS yeah. to, yeah. to Health and Health and Human <laughs> Services and everybody else? It does, it does have either it's an agreement or a memorandum of understanding with the company. Okay, so no resolution. So um, can we just have council and Shelley and HHS perhaps review it further and then come back with some thoughts, initial thoughts, and then we can take it from there? Okay, that would be an agendized item. Then. I, I'm not telling the date. Just you can give direction to staff. Staff would be happy to take a look at it and do analysis and bring it back to the board. Yeah, the staff recommendations. Okay. That's great. Okay. Fantastic. Let's move forward. With that. Thank you, board. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to consent calendar. Board members, is there anything under consent that you would perhaps like to uh, I am pull? I am pulling 2.6. Six, Bobby. See, I still can't get it right. 2.6, find no objection to the insurance issuance of a daily alcohol beverage license to E. Clampus Vitus uh, to serve alcohol at their dinner in Weaverville on, on October 7th, 2017. There's no fiscal impact. You want to go right outside? Yes, I'm going to recuse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. 
Stay away from the speaker. I'll, I'll try not to listen. <laughs> Okay, we have a, a supervisor Groves recused himself for 2.16. 2.6. Uh, does the board have any questions regarding this item? Any technical questions? We're going to open it up. What, open it up to the public. Public have any comment regarding this item? Bring it back to the board. So moved. I have a first and a second. Is there any further discussion regarding this item for the board? Seeing none, let's go ahead and vote on this guy. Um, 2.16, all those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Keith, I like the speaker outside thing. So. <laughs> yeah, you woke me up. <laughs> let's see if I can get to the next number. Going to try for 2.18. 2.18. When are you going to fix this? The way it was for the past 50 years. 2.8. Approve the board's response to the following grand jury report. JUR 2015-2016-001. Evidence and policies procedures. No fiscal impact. Clerk of the board. This is pulled by the public. Yeah. Hey, Graves from Lewiston. I was wondering... Uh, which board member was this assigned to, and why wasn't it turned in last year? <clears throat> Thank you, Kate. <laughs> okay. Um, that's all I need. We have a question. I don't know. No, we're not going to. Okay. No, I'll go ahead. Um, you don't have to. Yeah. No, but I think it's important. You need to, you need to tap me. Go for it later. So... Council, could you explain this? It was assigned to Supervisor Burton. Unfortunately, he's no longer on the board. Um, so, uh, so Supervisor Morris took our responsibility this year to get it done. Okay. Thank you very much, Keith. I'd like to uh, see if we can approve this. I'll move to approve. Second. First and a second. Rose Morris. All those in, fit in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, we already voted, we're all done. Uh, those not in favor say no, we're done, it's happened. Thank you, board. Okay. I'm going to go with 2.15. 2.15 General Services approve a lease agreement with the Hayward Watershed Research Training Center to lease and manage the Trinity County Business Incubator located in Hayward Revenue in the amount of $600 per year to General Services. Bobby and... Chairman. Chairman, if I may, I'd like to recuse myself from this item. Due Thank to you the very much. Interest. Stay away from the speaker again. Good morning, Susan. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. I would like to pull this item and um, postpone it until a later date. The Incubator Advisory Committee um, that they're suggestion, suggesting um, has not been the Superior California Economic Development uh, District, SCED, Smart Business Resource Center, and the Trinity County Economic Development Corporation has not been contacted to be, to be requested. And therefore, um, we're passing this with the intention of this advisory committee, but we do not know um, what their answer and reply would be. Okay, refresh my memory. Who was on the advisory committee? In the past? No, that was assigned to this. These people have been assigned going forward, sir, but they have not been um, contacted. I would like time to, uh, for Tony or myself to contact them and verify that they would be willing to sit on this advisory committee. Um, so this could have been done over the past month or so. I just saw this since Friday, sir. Chair sure. Ridley, uh, yes. so I have re reached out to a few on the advisory committee that have interest. Um, 
Chadwick's correct is not all of them has been identified after talking to Cindy in the watershed district. Um, the Smart Business Resource Center, they no longer have an office in Hay for. They do a mirror mill. That was one of them. Uh, Trading County Economic Development Corporation has somebody identified but not um, has not signed on completely yet out of Lewiston. Um, Trading County Water Works, uh, the name has been identified, but um, it's kind of correct as it's not a done sealed list of people on this advisory board. Um, I think it's a step in the right direction that this is a public, that the, this lease in general is made more public. It kind of reflects some transparency, uh, understanding that there was some contention on this lease in the past. Um, there's some um, things that do need to be cleaned up. Um, I think it's going in the right, right direction, but it is up to a solid advisory committee that will make the success transition of this business going forward. Okay, the, contention, the contention was not between the county and... No, sir. Okay. The contention was uh, against a, a tenant, a current tenant uh, for five okay. years. And when, when did the advisory board get put together? The advisory board, there was actually an advisory board that was created at the beginning that established the, uh, the current tenants. When did they get invader? Five years ago. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Supervisor <laughs> Morris. <laughs> that he's actually correct, sir. Um, in 2002. 2002. Yeah. It was there was an advisory. It was when um, Jefferson State Forest Products left, and then there was a default with the lease. The watershed uh, stepped into it as a uh, manager situation. So that would have been five years ago. Go ahead. So I have a question either for Tony or you, Supervisor. Um, if we were to move forward while these other groups right. fall in place, what would be the issue, if any? Um, these, this advisory committee, several of them have not been contacted. So what we are doing is we are saying that these people are going to participate when we have not yet confirmed their participation, or even know if they've been. I sit on SCUD, and I have not been contacted. I don't know anybody from the Spark Business Resource Center that has been contacted. Um, speaking to um, uh, Fair Manager Follett and Jim Bailey, uh, the previous incubator advisory committee in the last five years has only met once, and was not aware that this was happening until they received it, I believe, last week as well. So it, it's on page 238 if you're looking at the whole packet. I just saw it. How will this affect uh, the lease agreement if it's postponed? <coughs> we will not have a lease agreement, correct? We would have to. We're hitting the end of our extension we got three months ago. Um, the day is it. I believe we have October 16th. October 16th. When was the date that this one was supposed to be? October 16th. So, so the old one expires on October 15th. Then. So then we have to continue the next board meeting, we'd still be in time. But I don't think that'll give yeah, this enough time. And I, I doubt that Smart Center has any interest in this anymore. Um, I don't know how active the local advisory, the local board is. Exactly, and SCED, I don't know whether they really have an interest in this or not. Since you're on the, on the board, do, have they shown any interest? It has not been presented to SCED. But have you talked to um, this? I only saw it for the first time in the packet that came out after hours on Friday. So this is a, okay. this is the first time. SCED is not aware, to my knowledge. I became aware because I read my packet. So we've been dealing with this over the past right. month or two. Right. What's been going on in that past month or two? Do you have any idea? Yes. Mr. Chair, maybe we're going a little too far in okay. the question for you. That's fine. Well, we're just trying to figure out. You need to know how to control me. Yeah, we're trying to figure out how to. Do you need another extension or not? Is that what you're asking? <clears throat> I, I believe that we do have enough time, as County Council has said, um, to bring it forward um, in, in October, or even if we would. Um, 
entertain the thought of having a special um, board meeting specifically for this to ensure that the people that we are requesting who have not received the request actually participate as this advisory committee. Okay. Thank you. Tony, I notice your recommendation is to move forward with this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> is that still your recommendation? My recommendation. Um, I, I, I agree with the importance of this um, having a sound advisory committee, um, advisory committee on board. Uh, the success of the program, um, the transparency and the clarity for the tenants, and the program as a whole. I mean, it's important that that's established. So I would support, you know, postponing it. At the same time, I would support, you know, there is a number of uh, names here listed you know what they're looking for a two-thirds vote i know there's three interested parties right now um i'm sure that Mr. Chadwick would be one of them uh jim bailey mike follett i have been talking to mike follett the, the fair the fair board or fair association representative uh so i feel yeah i feel like there's a few good names established over there in the cap in the seat of the community hay for that could um Steer this in the right direction. Um, that would be the board's interest. What they'd like in, to do. In a limited if, amount of time, they'd have to steer in the right direction. Do you have the, the facilities the, and the budget to and the time to do this? No, and that's why I was hoping that there is a sound advisory committee because the success of this program as a whole, it would, it, if it was, you know, ran through the general services department, we do not have the right. I understand the, the horsepower to manage this type of program. So. You want to make a suggestion? If I would make a recommendation, um, my recommendation would be to continue this to the next board meeting and in the interim time, uh, advise staff to contact and reach out to each of these individuals to confirm their participation. We can talk about it on the third if there's anyone who's not by an alternate put in there, but at least we'll have some additional information at that time. <coughs> um, what about uh, also with the board consider just moving this forward today as is and then putting together, or not then putting together, but at the same time putting together the commission to look at this and come back not the commission, the advisory board to come back and give us an absolute direction on what they'd like to do. I feel like that would, okay. if they say no, then we're, we're in a worse position than if we find out now and then we can actually um, amend it with alternatives. Like an example would be Superior California Economic <coughs> Development District. Since I sit on that, we could just say that a, a board supervisor from District 3 or District 5 be involved. And then as far as the smart business resources. No, District 3. Three or five. No, three. Four or five. No. Yes, sir. It's in your your district. I know. So I, I believe that if given enough time and these people say no, we can come up with adequate alternatives, but we don't know until we ask. So uh, why don't we make a <laughs> suggestion also have Supervisor Chadwick take the lead on this to work with staff to have that kind of come together. Okay. I'm going to do something during our committee. Hopefully, it'll be resolved by then. It sounds like it needs to Yeah. We're going to table it. I'd like to hear from the public. I'd like to open this up to the public to see if there's any uh, additional information, comments you'd like to make on this. Seeing none. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Nick Ouellette, director of the Watershed Center. Thanks for the opportunity to talk. Um, so on the confirmation front, these are calls I made personally, Supervisor Chadwick, but I do know that Bob Nash at Superior California Economic Development District was committed to serving, and we've had direct conversation with him, and uh, Mike Follett at the fair, we received confirmation from, and that was on Tony's recommendation, and, and as far as I know, Mike got back to the affirmative. I can't speak to the Economic Development District. I know that Dwayne Hereford is not, willing to serve. We were looking to see if Jesse Cox was willing. Right. I don't have confirmation. I don't have confirmation on Smart Center either. So, Thank you. Um, but we'll do the work. What, Thank you. what would you like to see? Well, I mean, I'd like to move ahead, assuming in good faith we're going to work, work with these people, but to the extent that the board would like to have confirmation ahead of time, I appreciate that. So, either way, uh, this can work. Thank you, David. Yeah. Any other public comment? Seeing none, bring it back to the board. Board's pleasure. Keith? Uh, table. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've got to entertain a motion. 
Go ahead. You, it was your idea. Go ahead. <laughs> Actually, it was. That's my third time. I, I move to table it to the uh, next meeting or the meeting after. I think it has to be the next meeting. Which is the second? Third. 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 Okay. Better be here. Did you want to help put yeah. it together? Could Supervisor Chadwick and Lee? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. That would be my motion. All right, I second. Okay, I have first and uh, second. Any other discussion regarding this item? No. Okay, mm -hmm. seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you very much, board. Thank you, Bobby. Um, 2.25. Planning and zoning. <coughs> Ratify the director of transportation signature on an agreement with the Ecologic, Ecologic Ecology Research Center, IERC, for water quality studies to detect pollutants and evaluate environmental impacts. $150,000 from the transportation department cost to be reimbursed by the Bureau of Reclamation. Is that the state or the federal bureau? Uh, federal. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, public poll. Everett. Yes. Yes, it was Everett. Two dot two five. Uh, solid waste to prove an agreement. No. Ratify director of transportation's signature on an agreement with the. Uh, Integral Ecology Research Center, sir. Okay, my name is Everett Harvey, Weaverville. Uh, part of this is a lack of understanding or ignorance. Uh, I like water, so I'm very curious about the quality of our water. I'm curious who initiated this. This seems like sort of a small study, but uh, it's important to do. So I just would like to know a little more about what this entails. Okay. Thank you. That board would like to have a little bit more information. What does this entail? Um, oh, okay. hold on. We have one more public comment. Good morning. I just wanted to suggest rather than sample the Trinity River where pollutants are so diluted by the time they get there, I would suggest that water quality monitoring be done on tributaries with known high concentrations of cannabis growing. I think you would find that you that's where you would find the pollutants, not in the Trinity River. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. Just a real quick overview of this. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to do a public comment, please. Uh, my name is Christian Figueroa. I'm from Burnham, California. I'm a licensed professional geologist. And um, I have concerns and respects of this monitoring program. Um, where did it come from, first off and foremost? Secondly, um, what we're looking at here is establishing water quality, you know, testing and, uh, and essentially getting essentially a baseline in respects of rod rodenticides, pesticides, and NPK. Um, the, the deteriorous effects associated with cannabis um, operations clearly are associated with grading and associated with on-site wastewater treatment or lack of thereof. So I'm interested in why, in regards of the analytes that we're looking at, um, those being organophosphates, carbamates, um, pyrethrins, um, and then NPK, why are we, why are we excluding um, uh, turbidity, pH, specific conductivity, easy things that are easily measurable by a multi-parameter device, um, in addition to that, um, are we going to coordinate with uh, the Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program um, that's established by the State Water Resource Control Board and CDFW um, that I've been working with adamantly, um, establishing in-stream flows um, throughout the Trinity River Basin, particularly in the South Fork um, Basin and also on the main stem as well. Um, are we also going to coordinate with uh, the Klamath Basin uh, Management Program, and also CDEN. Um, and then additionally, um, why are we picking rodent um, road insides? Um, 
they're very difficult to determine. Um, they usually are um, found in nanogram per liter. They photodegrade rapidly. Um, why aren't we concentrating on Trinity River's um, 303D um, TMDLs? Um, and essentially, besides, you know, we've discovered all these things in water, what are the mitigation efforts that we're going to move forward with? You know, yet again, this concludes that 500 applications isn't enough. We need the additional 4,500 because essentially our mechanism in which we can control these things is through waterboard, waterboard enrollment. Um, this waterboard enrollment encourages um, the reduction in the elimination of uses of pesticides, rodenticides, yes. fertilizers, and nutrients. Um, and there's a better use of resources for $150,000 here in Trinity County. In fact, it can, be, it can be utilized to recruit planners in which then we can get people permits. Um, I'm just wondering um, why are we pursuing, you know, why are we pursuing this when the responsibilities for such um, measures can be accomplished by the State Water Resource Control Board and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife? Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Uh, seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the board. I assume we're pursuing this because we have a grant. Uh, we have an opportunity. Okay. It's something that was on our list of uh, items that we wanted to look at, investigate, if we had a chance and an opportunity. We had a, a funding opportunity uh, that expired at the end of the federal fiscal year to participate with uh, another entity to get this. So uh, anytime that we can piggyback onto something, I get it. we do it. So it's, 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 again, it's always a struggle when you're very limited on this resources. Okay, thank you. Did you want to follow up with any of the public comments? I, I will have a statement. Okay, Mr. Bobby. I was just going to ask Mr. Figueroa, um, <clears throat> would you be a competing industry with this, or is this just something as a public citizen you felt that you wanted to say? Um, my, my training is in um, aqueous geochemistry, and I'm just interested in why we're doing this. Okay. and why we're not pursuing getting people permits and eliminating um, you know, the issues associated with these contaminants. Because directly you know, with waterboard enrollment, there's requirements. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing these things come to fruition. I visit these sites okay. and I'm and seeing the reduction. Bobby, you have a question. You're not in a competing bid. Thank no. you. <laughs> there was never an RP either. At least I never saw one. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring it back. I would just make one comment that nothing. Um, do you want to wait for discussion or do you want to oh, make sure. a motion? No, I'm not making a motion. Okay. Do you want to discuss? Well, I, I'll, I'll wait until the discussion mm -hmm. yes. All I was just going to mention is that nothing prevents anyone from enrolling in the water board. There's no okay, limit to we're that. Just, yeah, just unfortunately, that I let the public go away with this. You know, I, I just have some further explanation of the program. Okay, technical explanation. Go well, forward. yeah, so this is working with River Restoration's okay. uh, money, and, as, and this part of this is what they have money available and what they need to be done that we can facilitate on top of what we have interest in. So. There has been no studies about contamination in the water and the, water, the watersheds. So we assume things, but we don't know things. And so this is a program that River Restoration is very interested in. They have the, the ability to do it, and we have the ability to take this money and get, gain something for our knowledge and their knowledge. Okay, thank you for explaining the program. Thank you. I'm going to keep up with the board. Does the board have any other questions or technical questions? Now I, I, I see the Helena fire was thrown in there, and, and Canyon <coughs> Creek was a mess a week ago or two, as Rick and I witnessed. So um, that's that's important given what we saw. Okay, I'm going to keep it with the board. What's the board's pleasure in this? Uh, I move to uh, accept two dot two five. Do have a second? Second. Okay. Any other further discussion, Bobby? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Can I ask all of you to speak into your microphone because thank you. Back here, right here. Thank you. Um, 
All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you, board. I'm going to move on to looks like to 2.17. 2.27. Transportation. Adopt the project construction plans and specifications for highway safety improvement programs. Writing project number one fiscal. Project number 5905 paren 099 Authorize the Director of Transportation to make revisions as necessary and authorize staff to advise for bids. Estimate of cost is $961,473 added on there. Yep. From Public Safety Improvement Program funds. Rick, or actually uh, Bobby. Mm -hmm. I just find that the, the price is really high, and I was hoping that you could explain how how we get to that amount. Um, so we're going to use a, as part of our grant, um, one of the things in the HSIP program is they want longevity when they make safety improvements. So we're using a, what's called a two-part last merit, um, essentially epoxic uh, uh, pavement stripe that they put down and dance with the pavement and then less, you usually get a life for about seven to ten years out of it. But the stuff's expensive, you know. Instead of so, instead of painting, you do the you you use this um, thermoplastic, which is a very popular uh, striping method in California. We'd like to use it up here, but it's susceptible to plows and gets peeled off quite often. So this is something that's made to be more durable with plowing. So the stuff's expensive, and we knew that up front, and that's why we applied for it uh, with the program. So how often do we normally have to paint the roads? We, we try to do it every year to two years. And, and uh, you think this will give us six or seven years? I, I'm hoping it gives us seven to ten. It's going to be, it's it's not, in Trinity, it's not so much based on um, the cars driving on. It's based on the truck traffic, the chains, and plows. It's really, that's where the striping and everything takes more of a beating than anything else. So in your cost analysis breakdown, this actually is cheaper? Than striping? Yeah. Uh, well, striping, um, it, it, striping may be cheaper, yes, but the rectal reflectivity that you get out of striping versus what you get out, this is much, much more Retro, or you know, much easier to see when it rains. It's particular to being highly retro reflective, so that when you're driving down, it's easier to see. And that's part of what the safety thing was: was these type of pavements or stripes are used selectively in safety programs, so that you can have a high value of accident reduction uh, versus what you have going on right now. And one of the one of the other things is we have. Broken striper a lot around the town, and I'm sorry, could you? we have broken center line striper, oh, okay. and this put in the double yellow, and, and those are you know things that we're trying to advance to make the road safer. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. If we we'll have any other technical questions, <laughs> no. <laughs> Seeing none, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Has this been used in Trinity County before? Um, John, is that a question, comment, question? Question. Has okay. it been used as training that before? <laughs> okay. Thank you, John. Any answer? No. <laughs> Sorry. You fucking bastard. Thank you, John. <laughs> County Council? I don't want to answer that question. I just want to know what it's Would you like to hear it? Please make sure that when we're talking to the board, we use proper terminology and we don't use any curses. If anyone proceeds to do poor in the future, we'll ask you to be removed. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Any other public comment? John, go ahead and get out. Okay. We're going to take a break uh, after this item is wrapped. No, we'll do it right after this.
Uh, we're going to bring it back to the board. <coughs> board to have any uh, technical questions? Yes. I'd entertain a motion if the board wants to move forward. I'll second. Thank you, sir. I first and second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. We're going to take a, we still have one more item in um, consent, but we are going to take it for break. Thank you. Supervisor Chadwick is calling the meeting back to order. I used to have a hearing problem. <laughs> now I have a sinus problem, right? Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. We're going to move on to item 2.28. Adopt the project uh, construction plans and specifications for highway safety improvement program, striping project number two, federal project. Number 5905, Ren 100, Ren authorize the Director of Transportation to make revisions as necessary and authorize staff to advertise for bids. Estimated cost is $908,732,000 from Highway Safety Improvement Pro Program Funds. Supervisor. I have no additional questions, Rick, because it's basically the same as 2.27, and I feel like you've answered all the questions I have. So. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, Board have any other questions? I'm not going to open it up to the public. Public have any questions regarding this item? Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the board. I'll move to adopt. I have a first from Supervisor Groves. Second. Second from Supervisor Chadwick. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Going to move on to our public hearings. Hopefully, I didn't leave off anybody who wanted any full other work. Uh, 10 a.m. public hearings. These items are notice hearings and will be heard at 10 a.m. or as soon thereafter as possible. The public is invited to comment on the matter once the chair is open. Uh, the public hearing. Going to move on. Start with grant 3.1. That was a request. Also, we'll probably move 3.3 up to right after grants 3.1 and move 3.2 to the last hearing this morning. Um, does the uh, board have any other things they'd like to move around? Okay, hopefully I've moved everybody it's around public. Hopefully you don't have it, want anything moved around. Okay, uh, 3.1, conduct a public hearing to consider submission of a 2017 community development block grant CDBG application. No fiscal impact to the general fund for application submission, estimated application cost of $5,000 from existing program income. Unknown indirect and overhead administrative costs should uh, should the grant be awarded. Uh, okay, not good news. Us, uh, supervisor, sorry about that. Uh, Jim, Mr. Cook. Yes, sir. You would you like my report now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, you may remember, some of the board members may remember, that back in about May, you guys held a hearing to take ideas. Uh, the block grant has finally come out in the notice of funding availability, and we've decided that you're going to have to hold this listening hearing again, uh, yet a second time. Uh, it consists of opening this hearing, taking any public input, and closing the hearing. There are no decisions to be made at this point. One of the things that we have discussed numerous times, and in fact we made an application a year ago uh, concerning the Lewiston Wastewater Project, that seems to fit the block grant program very well. And as of uh, just yesterday, uh, another idea came up that seems to fit pretty well, and that would be a Southern Trinity Child Care Center. I don't have enough details to discuss that thoroughly, but this, this hearing is simply to make those known to the public, give their, see if there's any other public ideas, and uh, let the staff try to see how this fits together. Does that answer, give you enough information? Yes, sir, for me to, uh, does the board have any other questions? Uh, when would you like to, when will you be holding the next hearing? 
The next hearing will be held in November and it will consist of an application so that you'll have to make a decision if you want to make that application at that time. And right now, it, it, those two ideas that have come out, there's, this, this county has used those funds in the past for a number of different things, several million dollars worth, housing, uh, business development. None of those that you've used in the past seem to be appropriate for this application because of your staffing levels in your, in your administrative office. It, it just, you just don't have the staff to be able to handle those. I was going to say, what staff? Well, that's just it. You're going to be down to your Bitcoin staff, and that's not really fair to anybody to do that. And, uh, and there are costs associated with some of these other things that the county has to weigh those items in. So, uh, but the two items that have come up uh, be minimal to no cost to the county and would greatly benefit the two communities, Lewiston and the Southern Trinity project. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to go ahead and open it up to the public. Public, have any comments on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the public. Oh, come on. Sorry about that, Harvey. Never Harvey Weaverville. I just want to say this is a very good program. I think you should go forward with it. And a lot of people, activist people here, should look for it as a source of being able to accomplish things that help the community. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. I have a technical question. Um, Jim, are these funds uh, ongoing? So to not use all of them, or is it a, a pile of rotating funds, if you will? It's uh, funds that come from the federal government, right. and they have been coming for the last 30, approximate 30 years, 32 years, something like that. They were originally part of uh, LBJ's War on Poverty, and then Nixon put the program into place. As of the last Trump budget, this program was eliminated. So it has been available to this county every year for the last 30 years, and the county has taken advantage of it a number of times. But the current Trump budget eliminates this program. Okay. Thank you. I didn't know there may be a need after this wave of funding. Something else. Well, they've also discovered that these funds are very handy when you have large disasters like fires and or hurricanes. Right. Uh, these funds are easily gotten into the public. So that may have a bearing on whether this program continues or not. Right. And I, and I was just thinking of the recent fire here. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, anything else? No? Okay. Good. I'd love to entertain a motion whether you want to move forward with uh, conducting a public hearing or not conduct a public hearing. What's the board's pleasure? To move forward. To move forward. Yeah. Then I'd love a motion. So moved. Okay. We don't need a motion to summer just yet. Okay. okay. We're going to so move okay. forward. Public hearing has been held. Comments have been received. And staff have been back to the future. Okay. Thank you. That's what you're looking for. Thank you, Mr. Cook. I, thank you very much. Now we move on to the good stuff. Have fun. No, no, you have to stay. No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't make me. <laughs> yeah. Then we move on to transportation. Uh, Three dot three conduct uh, continued from June twentieth, twenty seventeen, and there before. Uh, continued from August 1st, 2017, and continued from September 6th, 2017, a request to consider taking the following actions concerning intersection control for the Lanch Gulch Road, formerly East Connector Project, where, okay, I'm going on the right page, yep, where the project intersects State Route 299, one, adopt a CEQA initial study mitigating negative declaration, find that on the basis of the whole record before the board, including the initial study and the comments received, that there is no substantial evidence that the project will have a significant impact on the environment and that the mitigated negative declaration reflects the board's independent judgment and analysis 
Two, select a project alternative. Three, adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. Four, authorize the chairman to sign the notice of determination. And five, direct the staff to proceed forward with the selected alternative. And it's up to $22,000 from road funds. Good morning, Director David. Morning. is still there. Um, as I mentioned in the last meeting, we had a meeting with uh, Caltrans, with the director and uh, deputy director, talking about some of the things that we need to do or complete to take a look at and have this uh, reanalyzed uh, through a public hearing process. Uh, we did go through and set up kind of uh, a, a sketch of what we want to do, and I'll, I'll explain it real quick to you. What we, what we believe is that the information that we collected years ago was mainly for the T intersection of land coming into 299 and we felt it would be most appropriate now that the intersection has been running for two years that we go out and we recollect the data, get new counts and run it through the signal warrants again uh, to analyze uh, where we sat with uh, signal warrants and all we stop. Um, as that was estimated to take about $12,000 worth of uh, consultant uh, services uh, to get that stuff done. And then once we had that data, take the data and we present it to Caltrans, have Caltrans analyze it and uh, tell us if they were okay moving forward uh, with what was proposed as, as a potential always stop and then go through the uh, public hearing process as we had mentioned. So that would involve uh, uh, having a public hearing or a public workshop then a hearing by the Planning Commission with a final decision by the board um, months later. Um, looking through it, um, as I said in my recommendation, is that as a traffic engineer, you always look for the least restrictive measures first. And uh, I believed that the roundabout would have been the least restrictive measure, but as we know, it had problems and the board had chose not to move forward with that. So then I look at the signal on the old way stop and I'm looking at it from a sense of making a recommendation and looking at the timeline of what we'd have for an old way stop if it were approved and we were to install it. The old way stop is susceptible to many things. It's susceptible to action rates developing. It's susceptible to political process. It's susceptible to a community demand of having a signal. We have a signal. We have the signal plans. We have the money in place. Um, so it's kind of like I, I was. I had told other people it's like the last election. I had to do something I really didn't want to do, but let's not get too political. <laughs> that's, I, I guess. that's where I ended up. So, so I I believe as the best alternative to move forward at this time would be to install the traffic signal based on on uh, funding and plans. So with that, I can answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Keep the no. Okay. Mr. Quixote. Board have any questions? Um, or technical questions for Rick? No, I would agree with Rick. Uh, thank you, board, for giving staff as directed time to uh, bet this out, so to speak, and uh, given the timeline and what you laid out here, I would agree with <coughs> Director Tippett. Going to open it up to the public. Public, have any comments on this item? Dwayne Seifer, Hayport. Living is susceptible to dying. Doesn't make it right. You don't have accurate data to even make an intelligent decision. As long as Caltrans is going to keep screwing up 299 and the traffic, you won't know what impact we will have until that's over. Running a study when we have normal traffic flow is reasonable. What are you going to do about other businesses? And I haven't seen anybody talk about it. What happens to TOPS and CVS? It can be a problem getting out of there now just with traffic because of the highway stops. You're going to put in another signal so people can use the businesses. How are you going to get out and make a left-hand turn if you got traffic backed up with a signal? You're going to be interfering with traffic flow, and you don't know what the traffic flow will be. I would strongly suggest stand up to Caltrans, I don't like bullies, and tell them when they quit screwing up the roads up here so we know what traffic we really will have 
we can look at what alternatives are available that are reasonable. But I haven't seen a whole lot in traffic reports about accidents with the four-way stop we've got now. You know, that aren't attributable to alcohol or something <coughs> else. And, and I just think it's irresponsible when you don't know what kind of traffic you really are going to have to let Caltrans keep dictating stuff just simply because they have money. When we've been living up here for how many years, the 299 destroyed everywhere, and three, and okay. clumps of traffic coming through instead of ordinary traffic flow. This is stupid, and we shouldn't be pushed around for it. Anyway, I think it's a stupid idea. Thank you. Brandon <laughs> Sheen, good to go. So this is an update. Uh, it looks very similar to uh, what you got last time. That last time came from uh, last year's fair. This one came from this current fair. It's an informal poll. And um, I've got one for Mr. Tippett and two for the board that they can pass around. This is a two-way stop sign, and uh, that's what people want, and that's what they wanted last year. And um, so I agree with Mr. Seifert too. We all we do um, as a group. But um, anyway, 299 should uh, go back, and this was on Facebook just last night. It should go back to uh, the way it was flowing freely with the stop signs on both sides. So that's what the public, your people, your constituents would like. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any additional public comments? Good morning, board members, chair, Scott White Lewiston. I'm here today on vacation from my employer. And I want to make sure the public understands, Trinity County approved the signal, not Caltrans. We approved the signal in our environmental document for the project. Caltrans did not require it. They agreed with us, but we approved that signal. And so, and I appreciate today, I thought I would come in here and have a real conflict with Mr. Tippett. I appreciate his honesty in saying today that the signal is the right thing to do. That continued studies and looking at an option that's never been proved to work over multiple decades which is to stop control measures. We have the funding in place to do this, we have an environmental document in place. As I shared last week, we did a tremendous amount of outreach in the county in 1998. Public fires, direct mail to all the county, banners over Main Street, we did a ton of effort. That committee of nine business people and of five business people and nine residents unanimously supported the signal. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of the environmental document to CEDO. This is all public process. Board of Supervisors in public session approved the signal. We have the funding for the signal. It's clearly needed based on the traffic studies. It's unlikely based on, as you well know, all of the studies that have been done, including the current information from Caltrans and their engineering division, that they don't think that the all-way stop could be shown to be effective. So really, We'd go back, we'd spend more money that's available to use in other places in the county. we go back over things that we've already studied, further jeopardizing. Caltrans is very concerned with the liability of continuing with the all the way stop. When we have an approved document that says that we need to do something else, that was the interim to consider the roundabout. We're not doing the roundabout, which I think is the right choice. It's very impacting, very expensive. The money is very questionable. We have the money for the signal. Traffic engineering studies all through the past decades including through today, show that that is the right option for the county. It would be actuated, it would be a modern signal, it would provide brakes for traffic, which is an important part of the original project, it would improve circulation, it would provide protected crossing for the public. So really, I think we're at a point now where let's make the decision, because we're actually just, we're going, we've gone around and around, I think from the public standpoint, we spent an awful lot of time on this, when we have a decision, we can act on it. There's no risk to the county. Any other option that we pursue at this time continues to have risk of liability for us in implementing a measure that was always meant to be temporary. I really don't think that we can find out anything different than what we have today. So again, I appreciate Mr. Tippett's honesty with you here today. I think that the staff report clearly said that the most effective immediate option is to pursue what we've already approved. I appreciate Supervisor Morris saying that she recognizes that at this point we know the signal is the right thing to do as well. 
I commend you and I thank you for making that decision today. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you. Joseph Bauer from Hayfork. Uh, the institutional memory here is pretty short because none of you were here back when Caltrans did a traffic study and uh, actually told us that we're going to have so much traffic here, they're going to have to four lane 299 through downtown Weaverville and eliminate all the parking. That set off the bypass talk. So a bypass in the, on the western side of town was proposed. People living out there didn't want a bypass. So we went to the east side connector, Lance Gulch Road. Totally un unneeded, unused. And the reality is that Caltrans has never produced the traffic that they projected to happen on 299. It just, it's much less than what they proposed that we were going to have to deal with. So I think you need to take a, take a step back. Instead of letting Caltrans boss you around on this issue, tell them when they produced the traffic that they projected back in 1980, then maybe there's a need for a traffic signal here. But right now, a two-way stop on Glen Road is all that's really needed, and I would urge you to stick with that and tell Caltrans they have to show the traffic, the need for the traffic coming through Weaverville to indeed <coughs> cause a need for that signal or the roundabout. <coughs> the other two intersections here have been here, the same situation for years. Very few traffic accidents, either where Highway 3 enters the, high, the 299 or down at Washington Street. So that, that stop on the side roads works fine. You ought to stick with it. Thank you, Joseph. <coughs> I'm a Sergeant Battle with the CHP. I just uh, to be real brief, uh, we support uh, the Director Kippett's uh, idea of the traffic signal versus the alternative of the four-way stop that's currently there. Um, just being from working in the office, the four-way stop creates an issue with people trying to make a left turn on the 299 coming out of the DMV. DMV is actually very busy, it's getting busier and busier, and I see people stop there for two, three, four minutes just trying to make a left turn. Because if you do make a left turn, about the only way you're going to do it is you get in the left turn lane, you have to turn on Lance Gulch Road. So people end up getting stuck making a right turn coming into town and they got to flip a Yui down by the mill or something or pull around and it's uh, the traffic signal would be a lot better than what's going on now. That's just our support. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Every Harvey Weaverville I promised my neighbor, Dick Berry, that I'd get up and present his opinion too, which is, damn it, get a decision made and make it the right one. We both agreed that the, either the four-way stop or the traffic light seems to work. My personal preference is the traffic light. Um, I think it would break up travel a little more. I'm one of the people who uses Flash Gulch Road fairly often. And uh, being able to make a left turn in a reasonable amount of time is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Amanda Berger, Junction City. Um, one thing that I've noticed that I think is problematic with both stop sign and uh, signal is in the summer when we get a lot of traffic and we get what they call slugs and those long lines of cars. Um, I saw traffic backed up to Susie's Bakery and even one time as far as the Trinity Tire place. So on that side, and that becomes really problematic for many places and traffic pulling in and out. On the other side, uh, it becomes problematic for TOPS, CBS, all of those um, driveways. So I think that that's a really big issue as far as actually having traffic stopped at any given time. It's happening now with the stop sign. It'll definitely happen with the stop light. So I, my preference is roundabout, and it seems as if there's um, a lot of opposition to that, 
I think that they work really well. I think the rest of the world has been using them for a very long time, and they've been very um, useful, and I think it's what we should do. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Bowen, Coffee Creek. Uh, there's an old adage that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh -huh. Yes, you have to stop. You have to stop and wait a couple of minutes. But a stoplight would cost money, which I don't think our county has an abundance of. And I'd really see if we have that, if we have so much money that support the schools or something else. But this whole traffic stop has been working fine. We lived here since the early 60s. And um, I think we should, the, the county should spend their money on more, something more serious than the inconvenience of having to stop and wait a couple of minutes before you turn that left or right. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Uh, when I was working at the Planning Building Department in 2000, uh, they were talking about the East Connector, and somebody from the county mentioned the fact that they should put a stoplight in, and the guy from Caltrans said not, he would never touch that one. So I don't know what happened because we have less traffic then, or less traffic now than we did then. And as far as reports go, I was also involved with the airport. They they decided they wanted to put the airport on the ridge up here, and they had to, by law, find three places. So they found two places that sucked. And so it, obviously you had to use the ridge up here. So just like this report, this report is was aimed at putting a stoplight in. It was written to put a stoplight in. So the report is bogus. Okay, thank you, John. Any additional public comment regarding this item? I wasn't planning on talking, uh, Larry Fitzsimmons, Coffee Creek, but uh, since I've been reading about this uh, stoplight roundabout, uh, I've always wondered why stop signs on the two side streets uh, aren't sufficient since there's been traffic along 299 all along. Have you done studies on um, how many cars are using Lance Gulch, things like that, before making uh, you know any major changes? Thank you. Any additional public comment? I'm going to bring it back to the board. I just have a couple comments and then maybe a question for Rick. Thank you. Uh, just for everybody's uh, collective memory, this board, well, without Supervisor Chadwick, last fall. Um, she said it. Not last fall, but she didn't vote. Okay. Um, voted to have a two way stop. That was the board's pleasure until Caltrans arrived at the next morning or next meeting. And uh, I thought I voted against that. Oh, you might have. Yeah, you did. Um, but it passed anyway until Caltrans came back. Um, from comments in the public, you are correct. Uh, in 2011, uh, Supervisor Freeman and I adjusted some traffic in our RTP because those numbers just aren't coming through as predicted 20 years ago when this Lance Gulch Road um, was first developed 20 plus years, I think. So, um, you know, I think. This Director Tippett does propose updating those uh, traffic studies. Uh, I don't think anyone's really crazy about the signal. I know I'm not. I, I would prefer the four-way, but it will take more time and money. Uh, if the signal is approved, uh, Rick, um, are we able to have, you know, it will the signalization of it will get improved, meaning if you're coming in from uh, Buckhorn, you'll be alerted earlier that there's a signal ahead. Uh, I know we've had temporary signals and the stop sign at the moment. Yeah, we, 
one of the things, there's several things about the signal. First of all, there will be, uh, at minimum, three signal heads facing 299. Well, I should say at minimum two, but it will probably be three uh, facing each direction. Right now, you just have one flashing beacon. So you'll have that. You'll also have a, uh, a signal head uh, striping and signage that's usually about 400 feet prior to the signal. And that's meant for, really, it's meant for when you're driving in foggy weather, they have the indicator. But uh, things that we'll use, we'll use 12 inch heads instead of eight inch. We use all the large things that make it highly visible, including back plates and several things like that. And the, the other concern regarding the signal is uh, the backup of traffic. We've seen that when Buckhorn is in some type of repair every day, it seems like, um, especially after the road was supposed to be completed. But um, so, how will the signal help with that, or how can we adapt when that happens? Well, the, the signal's fully actuated, which means that when a car pulls up, there's uh, induction loops in the pavement that actually sense the vehicle being there. So, it will go and it will address cars that might pull up on the side streets, but for the most part, it will rest in green on the, the main main line, which is 299. Uh, but we do have a high number of uh, cars that come from Glen Road and, and from Lance Gulch. So I see, if I, if I could see the function of it with the pedestrians and everything, I think it's going to function pretty similar to the way the signal does in Punta Ventura and uh, 299 when you first come into Reading. It's about the best example of how this one will function. Thank you. Yeah, not just echo uh, collective memory. Uh, last summer, this board uh, chose not the roundabout, so that left us only with the signal light and the either the two or the four-way stop sign. And the funding for the signal light is available now. Um, we probably do not have to have it now, but we might not have the funding later. So that's what the board is, it comes down to. Um. <laughs> well, I, I will say that from District 1, Lance Gulch is used by a lot of people and like it a lot. Um, so uh, I think, quite frankly, the safest alternative is the uh, stoplight. Uh, you know, I voted for the two stops, so it's just not going to be an option. That I guess I'm the one holding the bag to uh, to select option two. Yes. On item three dot three, which for those that would be a stoplight, no action, which means the action. Well, actually, you're adopting the study that we did. And you're choosing the no project alternative, which defaults back to those kind of covers. As he said. Um, question and a reminder to the board and the public. I believe this is what the recommendation from the planning commission was as well. Yes. Yes. So just to be clear, it's adopt the sequence initial study for the mitigated negative, negative declaration, select no project alternative, changes in traffic signal, and direct staff to move forward with existing project. Speak up, please. We should have you come do it. Yeah. Thank you. Adopt C1. Oops. I'm going to try this one. You can sit up here next to Keith. That's fine. I'll just say it. Adopt CEQA initial study mitigated negative declaration. Select a no project alternative, which is the traffic signal, and direct staff to move forward with the existing project as earlier approved. This will have no fiscal impact. You had a question? No, he answered. Oh, he answered it. Keith, I've made a motion. We okay, have a motion on the table. Second. And Supervisor Chadwick seconds. Is there any other uh, discussion regarding this item? I, I do have discussion, and I would hope if this does pass, and I've mentioned this to you before, uh, Mr. Tippett, is that I would like to see some sort of, uh, I know it's not in a historical district, but the same sort of uh, thinking to, if there's money, to have more of a patina uh, 
crossover, you know, make it look a little more down, like downtown's historical district signs. And that would be greatly appreciated. We we can do that. It might take a little extra work on it, but it's not. And we're only talking about maybe a couple thousand dollars. Yeah. It's growing on trees. So is that your motion? And a second? Any other uh, discussion? Seeing none. I'm going to go for a uh, thank you. Knock yourself out. Supervisor Chapman? Yes. Supervisor Groves? Aye. Supervisor Morris? Uh, 3.2, almost disappointed everybody here. Uh, conduct a public hearing to consider introducing and waiving reading of an ordinance which amends the Trinity County Ordinance number 315 regarding commercial cannabis. Unknown fiscal impact. Who's starting out with this one? Oh, a lot of people. I think I thought you wanted to take a break. I was going to ask you to take a break. Mm, what? Yeah. Yeah, okay, we're going to take a short break.
We also added some different language, the ad hoc did, to uh, language related to pod lining. So uh, it was really tough to get some um, black and white information on that um, from our first recommendation. So if you, you'll see that we did some um, a little more flexibility in the language regarding uh, ponds, just construction of ponds. Uh, we also modified the distance from a school bus stop to be, uh, our recommend, recommendation is to be in good compliance with state law. Um, you also see probably the, the biggest uh, item that came out of the Planning Commission was some um, opt-out areas in the Coffee Creek Trinity Center area uh, as a result of the Planning Commission hearing. Uh, the ad hoc um, left that in there. The, um, let's see, bear with me. I'm just doing some of the highlights. Um, we also, of course, uh, left the three, the five uh, available Three uh, a just sorry type three outdoor licenses available, and we clarified some language uh, in, in eligibility and priority on that, um, which we may or may not. There's some questions that the ad hoc still has that we may have to get answered um, in, during the break. So those were pretty much. Um, not too many changes between the commission and uh, the ad hoc since coming to the ad hoc before the board. I said probably the biggest change was the opt-out areas um, that was discussed and heard at the planning commission. Supervisor Groves, did I? Yeah, I just want to, uh, on the opt-outs, we did do the same thing we did on the other opt-out areas. We put a timetable for having Thank a water you. board permit. And then on the three acre conversions, or not conversions. Type three? Type three. Um, uh, we did add that a use permit would be uh, required on the three acres. Yep, Those thank are the you. two other highlights mm -hmm. that we added in. Okay. With that, I think um, council has some legalese she'd like to speak to. Thank you. There's two issues I'd like to bring out to the board before this goes to the public. The first one relates to the opt-out provisions. Uh, at the Planning Commission, the Planning Commission asked staff to do an analysis to make a determination if there was legitimate planning or land use reasoning to have those opt-outs. As was discussed in the past, uh, you can't arbitrarily make these decisions. They have to be based on sound plan view, uh, planning and land use uh, methodology. In your packet is the memo from the Planning Department, which does go through um, the legitimate land use reasoning in order to have the opt out. So that is available for review and a, and a corporation. Uh, in addition, there has been some questions, that there's the ever changing questions regarding the CEQA language, in this, which is section two of this. Um, as the board is aware, uh, Prop, 90, uh, Prop 94, uh, SB 94, sorry, SB 94 uh, had in it a uh, language that can be utilized in order to bypass CEQA at this initial stage until July 1st, 2019. Uh, planning staff has contracted with a, a CEQA expert, both a, uh, from a planning perspective and from a legal perspective, and we've been working closely with them to, to make sure that our CEQA language is appropriate and compliant. Um, originally, the language that is in there is what was recommended. As of last night, in further studying of SB 94, the recommendation is to have that modified to read as follows. The county finds that this ordinance is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to Business and Professional Code Section 26055H until July 1st, 2019, because this ordinance requires discretionary review for the individual licenses that are provided for within. And that, uh, that utilizes the uh, SB 94 language. Uh, it, it prevents this from having any exposure to CEQA, and it allows the county some time to conclude and finish any CEQA analysis that we're doing. And uh, Chair, I just want to add the other thing I don't think we mentioned under, and going back to the Type 3 issue, um, we also added that 
you to to be eligible and apply is a 20 acre or more um, for the larger licensed outdoor grub. That would be only for type three. Correct. Okay. And Chair, if I may just comment as to one more uh, issue related to it. As we spoke about when this came before, um, once if the board were to approve this. Staff and council does do an additional analysis of it to make sure that all grammatical errors are corrected before it's adopted and the scrivener errors are taken care of. Um, again, this is a working document, and so at this level, um, we don't necessarily need you to point out small little typographical errors. We will catch all of those. Um, and uh, in addition, you know, uh, designations, for example, Coffee Creek Fire Protection District as Coffee Creek Fire and Volunteer Fire Protection. Uh, or district or however it's referred to, we will catch, catch those corrections and make sure that the final published document is uh, uh, grammatically accurate. Okay. I think that's, that's really it. <coughs> You're ready for questions? On the, on the uh, you want to start from the beginning and go through everything or just jump around? Well, what's, your, just... what's the commitment for me pleasure? Um, do you I don't have it. Starting from the beginning is fine by me. Uh, are you just giving the highlights then? Oh, in red? Just to clarify, the ad hoc committee recommendations all were also published in advance, so Got individuals it. have access to it. Um, I guess we could open it up. My recommendation we open this up to public comment, yeah. and then if we need to have anything answered or, or clarified, we can bring that back to the board and we're happy to answer it back. Okay. I just have a quick uh, comment or actually question on um, page 8 of 13, item B, the change um, for I, I or 2B. Uh, hang on, hang on. 8 of 13. Okay, got it. Yeah. Right here? Right. Yeah. The 20 acres. Um, many of the properties in Trinity County are not necessarily flat 20 acres. Right. So will there be a, a centering or an offset? I think people can um, break up their square footage however that makes sense. Their square footage of the farm? Uh, yes, of their designated area. Okay. We realize it may not all fit in one no. piece. <laughs> so, I, and, um, I will point out 20 acres is 20 acres. Right. What does that mean, super well, master? Well, 20 acres is married is measured on a flat surface. Mm -hmm. You lay a flat piece of paper over a mountain, and it's still 20 acres. Got it. That's why I'm wondering if 20 acres is large enough, or, or if there's a specification for... Well, I would love to hear testimony on what other people think about that. Okay. So, okay, we're open. I, I get you. My message is clear. You got it, sir. I'm going to open it up to public comment. Anyone? I, I see no public comment. I was being polite. I just tried to get up here first. <laughs> Wait and see for hate work. Uh, you all received my email, so I'm not going to go through all of that again. First of all, I think this is premature for approval. Uh, many of the reasons that I stated, but now I've heard comments openly made in this session that the ad hoc committee has questions that need to be resolved before they finalize it, their recommendation. Uh, we've heard council say there's a study being done that's going to modify the language and ordinance. So by no means is this even close to a final ordinance to be approved and adopted. And no more backdoor politics. Uh, we'll get around to it, you know, and then publish it without having public hearings. And this is supposed to be the first reading. I don't buy that. You put it before the public for what you plan to adopt and let us comment. Uh, there are other issues which I raised in my correspondence, so I won't take the time there. You don't have a tax in this county. And until you enact some method of putting a general tax on this activity, all you're doing is inviting people to become licensed farmers, and why in God's earth would they vote to tax themselves if they have a license and don't have to? You have to link an ordinance to some type of a tax, or why is the county caring? Where's the benefit to the county if there's no revenue source? And finally, it, most of you know, I don't grow, I don't use. But I'll be damned if I'm going to have bureaucrats taking away my legal rights to use my land according to the general plan and its zoning. 
and hide it behind Mickey Mouse conclusions. As I told you all, my land is zoned low density under the general plan. You don't come at me with a density argument. You haven't explored other options like using sewer districts, airport safety zones, all of these other things. And last I read, aside from the Supreme Court telling you, you can't have an ordinance inconsistent with the general plan, and I haven't seen a study that says how it is consistent with these car battles. The Fifth Amendment says something about you can't take away any of my property rights without paying for it. And if you affect my property values because you're doing something that you're not supposed to, then you're going to pay for it. And you don't have enough money in this county to pay for all the damage you're doing to individual property rights. You need to look at these things and use legal ways, such as airport safety zones, sewer districts, or other things, and a full analysis of these carve-out zones. What is the zoning? What are their parcel sizes? How many people are being affected? And deal with the parcels that you should be and not whole general areas. So you're probably walking into major litigation, and frankly, you can't afford what property owners are going to be entitled to recover from you from an illegal taking. I think this is premature. You ought to rework it and bring it back later when you have something. That doesn't require more questions and study that you've already admitted. Thank you, Dwayne. Anyone else? Thank you. I just have a timing and terminology question. Um, the staff report says that the opt-out for Coffee Creek and Trinity Center would exclude, exclude those who have a water board license before November 30th. The, um, draft ordinance is talking about having applied for an exemption. So is there a time frame between applying for the exemption and having a license and is the exemption and the license the same thing? There's just some inconsistent terminology between the two documents. I just need to repeat. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> so the staff report says um, allowing an opt-out for Coffee Creek and Trinity Center, excluding those who have a water board license before November 30th. The ordinance, that was the staff report, the ordinance says they have applied for an exemption by November 30th, so I'm wondering about exemption, license, application, having. It's in the moment. It, to clarify, the ordinance says exemption applied to by applicants who submitted an application for enrollment uh, and with the water board for this by December, by November 30, 2017. So I understand the confusion, but it is consistent. It's who has submitted an application for enrollment in the water board by November 30, 2017. But they don't have a license then. They just submitted an application. That makes okay. sense to the water board. Yeah. Hi, my name is Colleen Murray. I'm from Trinity County. Um, I would just like to make a couple comments. It really, the subject I would say would go to the cost of the license. I want to read a few things from a New York Times article. I have extra copies if anybody would like one. Um, California, which by one estimate produces seven times more marijuana than it consumes, will probably continue to be a major exporter illegally to other states. Mendocino has received 700 application permits per permits to grow marijuana, that is only a small fraction of the number of growers. Uh, based on data from various state and county agencies, Mr. Allen of the Growers Association estimates that only about 11% of the growers have enrolled in any type of program. Uh, because many growers say there is little upside from getting a permit. If they stay out of the system, they face lighter punishments. Um, so my question really goes to, it says um, fiscal impact unknown. Oh, actually, let me go real quick to the violent crime. Um, in a number of crime categories, violent crime, robbery, aggravated assault, and murder, among them, the Emerald Triangle is near the top of the list. The violent crime rate in the Emerald Triangle is seven times greater than that in Los Angeles. So it goes to the physical impact is unknown and I think the I don't know how you came up with that amount for a license but it seems completely insignificant 500 plant grow um, could gross anywhere between 500,000 to 1.5 million and you're charging little more than a taxi medallion um, I think something needs to be um, looked at such as the environmental impact the social costs the enforcement costs of illegal grows and the administrative costs um, I'll just say, I, I would think that growers who want to comply 
would want enforcement of those illegal grows. I can't imagine that they would not. Um, I can tell you just recently, Fish and Game went out on a raid. This is all public um, information. 5,000 plant grow, substantial environmental damage. The main grower was on probation, was uh, out on bail from a home invasion. She had employed three uh, Mexican nationals, and all of whom ran from law enforcement. Um, and one of them fought with law enforcement and tried to break one of the canine's neck. So I don't think that's what you want here, and I believe that's what you're inviting. So I think the fee needs to be much higher so you can go after the people who are growing illegally, which by many estimates is 89%. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Look, yeah, uh, when I first came here two years ago, we, we got into the program, and we must have gone at least 12 grand over what we wanted to initially spend to do this. All the while, I was told when I first went down to the, land, the Planning Commission that I, that I was on the wrong parcel, the wrong zone, and then I found, found out, Rick told me, that no, you're okay, you're, you're, not, you're, you're, you're in the right place. So it was a mistake that caused me a lot of worry and heartache that day, because we've been, you know, like I said, I'm a cancer patient, I can't make money very many other ways. This is a way to make money, and I can't understand why they why they would not let uh, somebody who was a cancer patient make a little bit of money out, out of doing this. And I can't understand why um, the uh, people want to opt out, opt out of a, uh, an opportunity for somebody who, who's just got sick, who lives in their community, one of their brothers or sisters who's sick. And this is a way for them to make money. No, we're not talking about more than twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year here. You know, I mean, I I personally I don't blame my sickness on the board. You guys have been pretty understanding and I've made friends with a good many of you. But the whole idea of being a cancer patient is that you're freaking broke, okay? You spend a lot of money. I'm going down to Mexico to pluck four grand down again, you know, for a treatment that I should be able to get in the United States more cheaply. But because the FDA bans it because they want to make more money, I can't get it. So I'm, I'm saying no to this idea of a rezoning. I was already zoned and I was already shown that I was in the right zone. What if I'm in the wrong zone now? after the fact. It just, just doesn't seem fair to me. But I, I appreciate your time, and I, I know you're good people, and I know you're going to make, the, make it right for everybody eventually here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Anish, and I live in the Coving Covington Mill area. Um, incompatible land use, that's sort of going to the core here, separating incompatible land use. And there's two ways that are being discussed here. One is the opt-out. I spoke at the Planning Commission, and uh, the ideas that me and, and many others about the Coffee Creek and the Trinity Center CSD have now been incorporated, and I appreciate that very much. I support that. Uh, the other is setbacks. Uh, I've never been happy with the idea that the setbacks or with respect to a residential structure. It really should go to the property line. I think that's much more consistent uh, with the way planning usually works, uh, and it protects you on your property, throughout your property, from the older uh, nuisance. So those are my points. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask a question? Is this the public hearing on the ad hoc report or the ordinance? The ordinance. Thank you. Matt Gill, Coffee Creek. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate the board on adoption of policies. Um, all the solutions, I hear a lot of problems with cannabis cultivation. Um, I'm a solutions-oriented kind of person. Um, there's a lot of solutions to a lot of the problems that people are facing, be it smell, be it crime, um, be it degradation of our uh, ecological areas. Um, there is a lot, of, a lot of new products on the market that are completely organic. Um, one of the biggest issues that we've had that I've seen in our communities is the fact that there's other trimmers that come out. There's from other communities that do commit crimes. They are not up to par like the rest of our residents. And uh, there's machines now that do that job. I mean, do we need to have people come from outside and do that? Smell, okay? We're talking about smell. We're talking about a two week period where in the zoning in your in your zoning regulations, the setbacks are perfect. I mean, you can't smell cannabis over 1,300 feet. 
it doesn't exist unless you have a cumulative area of number of girls, then it does create a smell. I mean, a cumulative area naturally is going to have a smell. I mean, God, if I live next to a dairy, I'd have a smell. And then in terms of um, the, the caregivers and the licensing, I just feel that the board needs to move forward and license as many girls as they can so they can be compliant. And uh, also I've noticed in other counties that there are workshops within the communities for growers that they can be compliant with the regulations and they have feedback from the local government to other growers from companies that do provide good services. And I am on the board of a distribution company, the third one in California for cannabis. And I know exactly where this industry is going, okay? People who are here that are worried about the degradation of their forests, degradation of ecological and water, the bypasses to the rivers and stuff like that. In a year or two, you will see a huge change in this industry, you know? In terms of recreational use, a uh, lady mentioned in the New York article that it is seven times the amount. Well, that's under MRSA, under medical. Once recreational use comes in January 1st, those numbers are going to change. You know, those numbers will not exist. Um, then in terms of the opt-out, why opt-out? If we're being compliant, we're licensed, why opt-out? Under what work of circumstances should Coffee Creek or Trinity Center opt out? Thank you very I'm much. Understand. Thank you. Joseph Bauer from Hay Fork. Uh, in the 40 plus years that I've lived in this county, I've always done what I could to protect the environment here. And I feel very privileged to live in this county with its really good environment compared to anywhere else you could live. And I think most people here feel that way. So I'm witnessing now a tremendous environmental degradation in this county. You've allowed the county to become widely contaminated with pesticides and contaminated imported soil. My hope was that you would regulate the growers here and enforce the rules to clean up the problems. Instead, you chose to make the issuance of licenses into a code enforcement witch hunt for unpermitted structures that had the effect of scaring off many growers that want to get legal and pay the fees. Well, now you have about 1% of the growers regulated and you have no fee money to enforce your ordinance. That allows the environmental problems just to get worse each year. So I think that, uh, you know, you need to make some changes. The state has now informed you that you're out of compliance with the state laws. So clearly the ad hoc committee has failed to regulate this industry and changes need to be made. The board needs to establish a stakeholders task force with varied interests to advise the board on cannabis matters and the whole board needs to deal with cannabis matters in open session. In addition, this proposal to start issuing licenses for one acre grows to your close associates stinks and you need to back off. We want small-scale mom-and-pop farms and not industrial-scale growers in this county. They just bring us a lot of problems, environmental problems and people problems. So let's stop the backroom deals and start acting to solve these, uh, these serious problems and do it now. Thank you, Joseph. Hi, Terry Mines, Junction City. Enough with the nonsense. Enough with this fraud of you guys have done anything wrong. You've done everything perfect, actually, to try to save our community. Um, there was a letter sent to the editor this week that was so inaccurate, complete fraud. It's absolutely not accurate at all for actually what's happened in this community. Um, 
I believe the degradation of what Mr. Bowers was referring to has actually stopped. I don't believe there's a lot of people coming into this community anymore. I don't believe that, I think the realtors and the title company is dead. Um, nobody's buying anything. Prices are coming back down. I know Mr. Seifert's worried about the price of this property. That's based on skepticism of the cannabis industry. It has nothing to do with it, because property values in this county were in the toilet before the cannabis industry came. You know why? Because these people killed the lumber industry. Instead of doing something that was correct and making a compromise that made it so we still had mills in this community that wasn't a complete failure, that now that the forests are all full so they burn like wildfires because there's no actual management correct, that's what's happened here. We have people trying to kill a cannabis industry that you people are trying to form. Please do not listen to this fraudulent nonsense. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Ever hurry again. Well, that's a again. tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I actually disagree with almost everything this guy said. Um, one of the things I was focusing on on this ordinance was the enforcement part, which is one of my favorite topics. Uh, one of the things that struck me was it seems very weak. It calls, calls violations of nuisance. And that sort of, to me, for someone who read, actually reads this stuff, most people don't read it. You know, maybe get a license, maybe grow as much as I care. The, you know, the license is just means nothing. Um, I can still grow much, many more plants. Uh, if there's no enforcement, What's going to happen is exactly so important. Things will go on as they do now and as they will in the future. Um, one thing that's not even mentioned there is if you violate it, do you lose your license or do you keep your license? It should be very clear that you lose your license if you violate it. It's not clear to me that a nuisance is strong enough. Maybe it should be a misdemeanor or some other criminal level. Um, maybe we really should go the Siskiyou County route and uh, ask for help for enforcement. Uh, maybe we do need National Guard. Maybe we do need more help. Uh, supposedly, with the uh, recreational uh, marijuana, there should be monies available to counties as long as they don't opt out of growing and uh, commercial sales, retail sales. So there should be funding available. But as I hear it, and the guy previously said, let's just go on the way we are. It's all great, it's all good, and it's going to get better. It's not going to get better unless we do something. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Brian Bogdanich, and I am the owner of Bonanza King Resort in Coffee Creek. My wife and I came up 12 years ago, and we bought a struggling resort. And for 12 years, we've been working our tails off to bring it back. And we've done a good job of it, and we've gotten the business to go pretty well. The last couple of years, we're seeing a percentage of the business dropping off just like other resorts in the, in the community. So it's from the impact of the marijuana growing. It's having a, a, an actual effect. So when you ask, why hop out? The community of Trinity Center and Coffee Creek as a whole wants to, they, they want to hop out because Trinity Center, Coffee Creek, <coughs> the whole North Lake area is part of a gateway to the Trinity Alps and to the lake. And tourism is such a big deal when it comes to the North Lake area. And so we can't destroy that. We have so many people that come up from the Bay Area, Sacramento, across the country with weddings, all kinds of different things that come to the Trinity Alps. So we can't have, it's hard to have that. There's, there's so many other places you can grow. And the train's coming, and, and marijuana is coming with a charge. I understand that. But when a little community 
comes as a whole signing petitions and showing up the crowd that's here I'm sorry the, the, the crowd that is here in the community being here is huge and it's just the one area that we're talking about so that's why we think it's best if they do opt out and we don't have this problem because I would hate to think that my property that I have well over a million dollars invested in be worth nothing and that that's my life and and there's other resorts that are going through the same thing so you have to look at both sides of the story and, and please don't ruin people's lives in that respect so if there's just a small community and the whole community wants it there's people that are talking about it they don't even live in the area and they're saying why off out they don't even live in the area they don't understand what we go through so please consider that and uh, hopefully you do walk out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Hi. My name is Lenore Stanson. I live in Lewiston. I'm going to piggyback off what he was just saying. Uh, we presented to you about a month ago a list of people in the Lewiston community that did want to uh, continue the opt-out. I have an updated list of now 215 names. We presented 177 last time. Um, a lot of the areas that we live in the community of Lewiston is highly densely populated and near the Trinity River, and so we are concerned about just the environmental issues related to that. Um, we just feel like the commercial growing, which some people are saying is not a good thing, uh, is because of the smell, the crime that it brings into the area, um, and again, the environmental issues, and the un just the undesirable element that tends to come in with some of those, those issues there. We didn't move to Lewiston to live next to a commercial grill. That's not why we came up here. We came up here for the for peace in the rural setting and that kind of thing. Um, so therefore, I just want to say I support the opt-out area, and I'm representing these, and I bring the, the list for you too, uh, to, to keep that in the permanent ordinance. Um, I also want to publicly thank Ron Hanover. He has come into Lewiston especially, and he has done a great job in, in uh, when he receives complaints that about the illegal grows, that he actually is doing something to help us as a community to uh, stop those commercial grows. And I also want to thank Keith Groves. He's come also into our community a few times and talked to us as a community um, in helping us to keep this designated opt-out area. So I just want to publicly thank uh, Keith Groves for that also. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, <clears throat> Ben Brady Wildwood. Um, there's a lot of negative stigma around cannabis growing obviously <clears throat> but I, I think um, a lot of the you know the view of, of the harms that come from cannabis growing it's related to unregulated cannabis growing <clears throat> what you guys are doing here is, is creating a framework so we can have rules um, so people can run businesses professionally and like <clears throat> that's what you guys need to do this is in the early stages this is very early stages. Things don't just happen overnight. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> like people need to give this a chance to like take hold and have an effect. You know, this has been a year, maybe 18 months, but that's not a lot of time. The people that are coming forward to get licensed, these are people that are serious about running a professional business. They're serious about. Um, <coughs> You know, like taking responsibility for what they're doing and doing it in a, you know, a considerate way. <clears throat> so we just need to move forward. We need to act on this today, hopefully. Um, give it a chance. Like I understand people don't want, to, you know, neighbors that are just being really disrespectful and just doing whatever the heck they want. I understand that. That's not the type of people that you guys are creating this framework for. You guys are creating this framework for people who are going to be good neighbors, who are going to be good stewards, and they're going to run a professional business just like any other professional business, you know. We've got a lot of stake in this game if we're trying to come into this compliance process. So we'll probably be your best friends as neighbors. Uh, give us a chance to move this forward, please. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Debbie Long from outside of Hayport. I'm um, again here to encourage.
encouraged a couple of different changes that I see here. Um, first of all, the one acre grows, although it says there's only five of them uh, permitted here. Um, we believe that one acre grows are too large for our county. Um, we are trying to set up so that we recognize small and medium sized family farmers who want to come, stay, raise their crop, their kids, as well as their product here. And once you open them, kick the door open for one acre grows, it's way open. However, I do appreciate that there has been at least a minimum parcel size placed with that that will uh, allow those grows, if you go forward with them, to be out and farther away from the communities. Secondly, regarding the carve-outs, um, I understand that some some people think that uh, you know we've all, we shouldn't have carve-outs. Other people in the county are all for them. Um, I think that uh, the communities that are in the carve-outs, we need to go ahead and keep those carve-outs now as long as we keep it tight. You can always loosen up later. And speaking for Hayfork and the people I have spoken to in Hayfork, we need to have this board in its entirety come over to Hayfork for a midweek evening time meeting so that people can come and voice their uh, concerns. I have spoken to people who live out um, who live out, um, I'm getting the name of the road now. <laughs> People who live out uh, certain roads that say, oh, well, none of, nobody cares out my road because everybody grows. And then other people from the same road who say, I'm surrounded, I don't know what to do, but I don't dare speak up because I'm afraid of retaliation. Now, we start with inside the water district, that's very broad. With inside our water district, there are sewer districts, there are, are smaller districts to talk about, but the town itself needs to be made safe for families and elders and retirees and people who come to live in a town and want to be able to have their children and grandchildren get on their bikes and ride down the street to the park or to the school or to their friend across town without concern of increased traffic, increased um, strangers coming in during the planting and, and um, the clipping season that we're going through now. In addition to that, one thing that has been taken out of this that I think that we really need to talk about, and this ties into some of the concerns other people have spoken about, on the main arteries especially, we would highly recommend that you put language in here that on those especially main arteries that bring people directly into our towns for our fairs, for our resorts, for our festivals, for our school sports, that there not be any visible from the road. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Thank you. Hi, I'm Pam Wogsberger from Covington Mill. I have copies of petitions for you signed by almost 300 residents, homeowners, and visitors asking that Coffee Creek and Trinity Center CSD be an opt-out area. The North Lake economy is recreation-based. We have Trinity Lake, the National Recreation Area. We are gateway communities to the Trinity Alps. Highway 3 is a scenic byway. We have our own visitor center. The Trinity Center CSD has a recreation authority under LAFCO. I could go on and on about how important recreation and attracting vacation homeowners and visitors is to our economy. That economy is not compatible with the nuisances associated with commercial cannabis production. We have a large contingent of North Trinity residents here to support our request. To save time, I'd like to ask the people who are supporting this to raise their hands. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Please heed the wishes of our communities and prohibit commercial cannabis production. Thank you. Should I give the... Yes, to the clerk. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Board. Uh, Good morning. Jake goes from Chris, Hayfork, California. Uh, I've lived here my entire adult life. Uh, sadly, I did not get to grow up here, which was not my choice. Uh, great news for everybody here today. I think that there is a huge misunderstanding on what's going on. Uh, I'm a large scale, how do I word this with the current not so large? A uh, large-scale commercial medical cannabis <laughs> marijuana cultivator, is that correct? Uh, 
farm. I live on uh, and operate over 500 acres in Trinity County. Um, I started on three acres and worked my butt off to make it to where I am today. Uh, I'm still dead broke and suffering, so we can put that whole making millions of dollars assumption out the window. Um, I know a huge amount of people that are in the cannabis uh, licensing program. I know even more people who are not in it. Uh, the people I am most proud of that I consider colleagues and share this occupation with me have stepped forward and are in this program. There are some of the best neighbors and people in this community who recently were fighting side by side in Junction City, saving some of the biggest haters' homes when they fled some of the areas around Junction City in the fire. Um, I would love to see all of the degradation to this community and to this forest and to our environment gone. That comes with the black market and that comes with the unregulated cannabis. I want to see regulations. Um, I also want to see respect of our neighbors. I feel so much hostility in this room and I could not imagine what it would be like to not want to see cannabis and have it be directly next door to you or sitting on a property line. I think you guys have done a phenomenal job of putting setbacks and putting regulations in place to try to make everybody happy. Um, as far as type 3s go, I would love to see the same momentum that is done with any other kind of agriculture in this community, but I would like to see part larger parcel minimums having to do with type 3s, that somebody that lives in a neighborhood that has three acres of land doesn't have somebody growing one acre next door to them, uh, that it's just appropriate placement for these things. It will help eliminate a huge amount of nuisance issues that as a grower, I would like to see taken out of this community. I don't like to see these run down, ramshackle, for lack of a better term, crack houses on the side of the road. I want to see this community cleaned up. I also don't want to see this community ruined, and I don't want to see property values for the entire community where they are in Trinity Center. So I think we need to have an entire balance through the community to get the illegal players out of this game and support the people who want to have a legal business just like a gas station or a restaurant or any other agricultural business. Thank you. Thank you. Christian Figueroa for Ranch. Um, I would like to bring the attention of the board to the former standards of commercial uh, cultivation, section six, better you. Um, for hypalon, rubberized, and impermeable barriers that are not allowed for lining of water ponds on the property. First off and foremost, it's hypalon, not hyperlon. That's been taken out. Okay. Has it been taken out? And yeah. we put uh, a different flexible language in there. Okay. Still yet. Um, the discussion and respect of the reasoning behind lining ponds, um, and particularly rather than utilizing clay liners. Um, Due to, um, well, clearly, pond liners are not allowed <clears throat> in in-stream ponds. However, on off-stream off ponds, the use of liners is our means as engineers and geologists to mitigate, essentially, slope stability issues. Um, and in fact, um, utilizing these pond liners increase our factors of safety incredibly. Um, using clay liners, for instance, um, it takes a while to, for them to settle to actually act as an impermeable surface, and we risk the potential for saturating the embankment and then thus failure, especially in our seismically active area that we live here in California. So I would encourage that um, we do not incorporate any sort of, you know, not being able to utilize liners, you know, for the construction of ponds, you know, granite in stream, no good. And in fact, that agrees with uh, Fish and Wildlife Code, Fish and Wildlife Code 1600. Um, but for um, off-stream, you know, diversion of storage, and also for rainwater catchment, it is encouraged. Um, and in particularly with the new water board's requirements and respects of not being able to use groundwater wells subsequent of gauge, um, you know, falling below the threshold essentially, in which we're not allowed to divert divert water um, for for any sort of use besides domestic. Um, this, is a, this is essentially a mechanism in which it's affordable for cultivators to develop water storage and liners are, a cru they're crux. They're incredibly important in regards of the development on top of other essential things like spillways and so forth. 
and diverting it to appropriate locations and then discharging it to biosoils to encourage infiltration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Holiday from Down River. I would like to uh, kind of speak to a few things that people have been talking about today. And uh, as far as the cannabis uh, train coming, I've been a cultivator for about 20 years. And yes, cannabis train is coming to the rest of Middle America and the rest of California, but it's been here. And as someone that feels like I have my finger on the pulse, the train's leaving Trinity County. In two, three years, you're not going to see the amount of outsiders moving into Trinity County to buy up a piece of land, to do environmental destruction. The, the market isn't going to be there for out-of-state sales. Um, the, the profit margins aren't going to be there for folks. So the, the idea that all these people are moving here to do all of this, that is not fair to say. I would, I would say the exact opposite is about to happen. We're gonna see a lot of uh, economic downfall around here, and what we need to do is support the farmers that actually wanna have a business here. Support the farmers that are professional businessmen and women. Um, and as far as you know, the, the carve-outs and things like that, if your neighborhood doesn't want it, I'm all for that. Just because, you know, I think NASCAR is cool doesn't mean I should put a NASCAR track in my backyard and everybody else, you know, hates it. it just because it's not so harmful and it smells bad and it's loud, I, I think it should be okay. I, that's not, not the case. I think that these large farms should be allowed. Um, the Type 3 permits that you guys are releasing, I think are a good idea. They will give us a chance to grab market share because the big boys are coming elsewhere. These farms should be allowed, but I do, um, I do like the parcel minimum. I own a 20 acre parcel. If I tried to squeeze a one acre grow onto that, I would cause a lot of environmental destruction. I own a 200 acre parcel as well, where there would be no single tree cut down, very little grading done. And I think by trying to squeeze a one acre grow onto the average 20 acre parcel in Trinity County, even a 40 or 50, it, you're going to see a lot more environmental damage than you are putting these, these big farms out of sight, out of mind, where a lot of the people would, would prefer it, and you would not have nearly the environmental destruction problems that you would have by putting it on a seven acre piece. or you know, on, on 30 or 40s. I mean, sure, I'm, I'm sure that there's 40s that fit the mold, but this is Trinity County, it's not flat. Thank you. Thank you. Howdy, board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Larry Glass from South Fork Mountain. I represent safe alternatives for our forest environment. SAFE uh, signed off on the original urgency ordinance because we bought into the argument that regulated world of cannabis was better than the unregulated world we've been living through. A year and a half into it here, I'd have to look back on that decision and question my sanity at that point because we haven't achieved much of anything during this period of time. The outlaw world has continued to expand. Yes, there's been a lot of diligent growers come forward and want to comply, but they represent a small minority of the over 5,000 grows that are out there in the county. 
your county council has given you a way to evade the Environmental Quality Act of California for, t for almost two years uh, in the future here. CEQA was originally enacted to enlighten decision-making bodies on how to move forward so that you don't create environmental problems. So you don't have, I mean, if you go forward and grant permits to people without doing a CEQA study, what are you going to do two years from now when you do the CEQA study and, and it turns out that you shouldn't have granted a, half of those permits? You're going to take them back from those people? Then you're going to have all these people bringing taking cases, taking lawsuits against you. I think that you need to, whether you can opt out of doing CEQA now or not under the state rules, you need to do a full CEQA study. Why blindfold yourself when creating uh, something when you don't know what the environmental impacts are going to be? And that was the, <clears throat> the original excuse for coming forward with the regulation was to lessen the environmental impacts. But you, you don't know that until you finish the study. You've got a 10-page letter from Department of Fish and Wildlife that outlines clearly for you why you need to do CEQA and why you need to do it now. now I recognize you have the legal ability under 94 to, to get out of doing it, but I highly recommend that you not do that, that you engage in a CEQA study immediately and then craft your permanent ordinance based around the information that that gives you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Point of order. Yes, Isn't sir. Isn't CEQA being done and being done currently, right now? We, have, we will discuss done. that at the end. Thank you. Thank you for asking, Jake. Good morning, Chairman Fenley and members of the board. My name is Clarence Rose, and I'm here representing Trinity Action Association. And uh, you'll remember that in August of 2016, when the urgency ordinance was rolled out, although it wasn't our favorite course of action, we decided at that time to make constructive comments and help the process move forward. And we're again here today to make uh, what I would consider to be constructive comments. The uh, carve-outs, my comments are related to carve-outs and one-acre groves. The carve-outs of concentrated population areas advanced policies stated in the four principles and are consistent with wishes of a clear majority of the residents of those areas. We recognize that the boundaries of some of the carve-outs might be better refined, but because of the urgency ordinance not being extended, stabilizing the expectations of all concerned by getting this ordinance on the books is the job that needs to be done today, and the carve-out should be left intact. The proposal for the ordinance to authorize up to five licenses for cultivation sites up to one acre appears to be inconsistent with the county's stated policy of providing a regulatory structure that favors small mom and pop grows described as artisan or boutique. We think that the small regulatory compliant growers should be given a chance at their branding concept and allow larger, uh, allowing larger industrial sized grows goes exactly in the wrong direction. Then there's been a lot of talk about CEQA, and Larry gave you a pretty good rundown on it. And uh, I would just like to suggest that in this county government, we have a planning department that has a certain amount of CEQA uh, qualification and expertise. And I really hope that uh, as you work on CEQA documentation, that you move forward on a transparent and logical path. Uh, it's essential that we get this CEQA piece right. I'm personally willing to still hope that supporting regulation compliant growers will raise some money to go after non-compliant growers with, but it's getting really hard to understand that that's ever really gonna take place. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Patrick Cohen from Down River Cider. Uh, I just, I didn't know anything about the pond. It totally struck me today because I hadn't been able to catch up on that. And I, I, I am a farmer and I have a pond that's engineered. It's been put in in the last year and it has an EPDM pond liner. As per what seemed like the most likely 
put forward because it had the strictest environmental regulations with it. It's the best liner. It's fish, it's fish friendly, it's human friendly. So that just struck me. I was like, whoa, back up. And that's not new for this process. But it's removed. <laughs> it is removed. But, I, but what I want to speak to is that's not new for the process because I don't actually have a lot of footing here yet because we haven't actually come up with an ordinance yet. I've been moving forward and steps back a lot. And so that's my point. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, but I want to speak to, you know, that we need you to move forward and get some of this so that some of these people here who, I, I'm sorry, but the ship has sailed. Marijuana is not what it was yesterday. It's not the illegal thing that it once was in the state of California. And that's going to continue to change unless the political spectrum changes real quick here. And so for those people who really feel burned by that, I'm sorry. I, I really am. Like, I'm hearing people's concerns about their their neighborhoods and their livelihoods. And so I, I, I feel you, but what, you, what I seem to... What seems to be missing here is that this is the opportunity to do something for your community, for your environment, with the laws that exist in the state. And so a lot of this has come from the communities that surround us in terms of, you know, why would you allow a six acre grow? Well, or an acre grow, because there's a six acre grow next door to me, but I live in this county. So there, other counties are gonna do things different, and I respect your right to do things different. But the, the idea that just by regulating the small grows and not looking at the state's, state's projections and standards and directions isn't helping any of us. And that's, that's how I feel. You know, because I've been stepping forward to try to represent an environmental um, stewardship of the land and to move forward in this industry correctly, in step with as they come about and as per the direction that you give. And that's hard. So I want people to hear me too. That's hard. I have a different perspective than you behind me, but I want you to respect that we can have different perspectives and we can move ahead incrementally and get something right and do good things for this community. We're not all the same when it comes to the grower community. And we need to help the ones that are stepping out too. So I hope you can move forward swiftly with that. And I hope you did get my email talking about type three grows and my thought process for justifying those. And if you haven't, Judy, I'll, I'll make sure to get it to you. But, you know, it, it justifies my thoughts about larger versus smaller and why you would allow that on certain acreage. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Oh, barely. Uh, barely, <coughs> but thank you. Uh, John Lanko, Douglas City. Uh, Yes, the CEQA study. If only there was a mechanism where we could conduct our initial study of CEQA analysis while having a permit program. Unbelievable. Uh, as regards to Fish and Game Letter, I'll give you a minute rundown on that. Um, first of all, it strikes me, I would say a shot across the bow, except that kind of envisions equal forces. This is more like a missile over Japan. Uh, <laughs> It touches on some stuff, yeah. <laughs> First of all, starts off clueless on what we're actually doing. Your ordinance is going to increase cultivation in Trinity County. No, it's not. It's going to reduce cultivation in Trinity County. Are there issues to look at? Yeah, they list things. Erosion, water board looked at, with sequel. Clear it, Cal Fire. Artificial lighting, we have an, exist uh, an existing ordinance on that. This ordinance addresses that. Noise. We have an existing ordinance. This ordinance addresses that. <clears throat> Hazardous features. Water board. Anticoagulants. This ordinance says no. Water board says no. Department of Pesticides says no. CDFA will say no. Pesticides again. Same agency. Uh, greenhouses might require extra fire breaking. Are they saying we are doing too much fire breaking in Trinity County? Uh, <laughs> access routes need to be analyzed. Cal Fire. Uh, let's see. I'm coming up on my minute, so I'll cross. Uh, there's more. If you want more details, I got them. Um, there's a joke amongst lawyers. It says one lawyer in a small town is sleepy and bored. Two lawyers in a thriving economy. 
three lawyers in a small town means you must be in California. <laughs> so, in continuing this parade of attorneys, uh, I do disagree with some of my colleagues. Uh, but I want to start with what I agree on. I agree with Mr. Sieper. We certainly need a tax. I, I've supported it from the beginning. I still support it. I'd love to see it. Uh, that's where general fund money should come from. I want to see that. Uh, I agree with Ms. Murphy about the uh, article in the New York Times that I thought was interesting about the 10 to the 12 percent. Uh, what I thought that, what I took from that article is it puts to the lie of the concept that the urgency ordinance was too hard so people didn't want to enter it because of all the other things it did. We're getting 10 percent of compliance across the board in California. Um, what I disagree on is enforcement. I think the best thing we can do for enforcement to reduce the amount of cultivation here is have a thriving regulated industry so that we bring prices down and drive the black market to a place where it doesn't compete uh, economically. People are here to grow because it makes money. Uh, so when it stops making money, we're going to see them dry up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking about lunch. Okay. Hold on just a second. You can't stand? You can stand. I just don't talk for a second. Uh, how <laughs> Does the board want, want to take a, a break for lunch? Yes? No? At some point, we're going to have to. Right. Because public comment will probably go on for quite a while. But we can come back and continue public comment. We can right, continue public comment. That would, that would be it. So, uh, we're going to take a break for lunch after Ms. McIntosh speaks. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, but but you might change your mind, so you might want to move to after lunch. No. <laughs> no, okay. No I more. love screaming into the wind, but I'm going to do it now. So, um, good morning, and thank you so much for hearing this in a timely fashion, especially with the fires. I know everybody wants to move forward. That includes me. Um, I like to. I agree with a lot of the comments here. I saw Dwayne Sieper's letter, and I agree with that wholly. So I don't think I need to go into detail on that. I also agree with both Larry and Joseph. I think I would love some clarity on the CEQA. My understanding is that our CEQA only covers the 500, and so while I see, like, I, I think there's a difference between that and a programmatic EIR. I'd love to know what those differences are. And whether or not those things need to be amended today, or if we can move on and do this separately, that would just be great because. My big concern with that, and, and though there are redundant things that I do think that you guys have covered in, uh, in regard to the DFW letter, some things that I am not clear about is that it seems really clear in that letter that they don't want to see you allowing new impacts before addressing the existing impacts. And they also made a statement that made it sound as if um, you do your CEQA and based on the way it's, it's done, is uh, it's not covering all impacts and that the individual may be left to cover other site-specific details and environmental documents for that. So I'd love some more clarity on that. And my big issue with it is that if they are saying, and I've been told by a supervisor with the department that this letter has also gone to other counties, including Humboldt. And so if they are really threatening to take, to not approve LSAs in a, in a good, timely fashion, that, as you all know, the rules have changed. So here I have a 180-foot well, and now I have to do an LSA or get written agreement, or written verification that I don't need one. So if they slow down the process and, and we don't address it, then we'll be stuck there if they don't actually, I mean, according to SB 94, section 48, 26060.1BB3, the license will not be effective at the state. And I think even with the temporary, unless we get this, we are in compliance with Fish and Game Code 1602. Um, with the cutouts, I think they'd be better addressed with overlay, overlays, but you've heard that song and dance. And with the type threes, I don't know where you got the 20 acres. It, it sounds like it's just being plucked. And I think with the setbacks, we know that the 500 setback from the property line absorbs over 23 acres. So I guess I don't understand exactly where that number comes from, but I love, love the idea of a use permit. Um, I think anybody would have to do that. And I think, you know, just for whatever you want to call it, for CEQA purposes or what have you, I'd love to see a way of addressing or addressing existing impacts. And that doesn't necessarily mean that only five that farms have to have grown cannabis there, but you know, if you're ag land and you have the space and it's, the impact is there, some way to do that would, would be my opinion on how to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. It's 12.10 right now. I'd like to uh, 
recess until 1.30 uh, or lunch. I could torture you with different plans. 1.30, I'm going to call the meeting back to order and continue with public comment. Do I have any papers for public comment? <laughs> We're still on the same issue of the cannabis. So, if we have a 300 foot setback, so it's 300 feet from both sides, and 100 foot in the middle, so that's 700 feet. So, 700 feet square is the minimum size you can have. That's 11 acres. So, how do you do a one acre grow? Thank you, John. <laughs> I just wanted to state that I'm in support of passing this and moving back in the right direction of regulation. This has been kind of a weird lull in our progress for a lot of us businesses that are operating. It's been kind of a challenge, but uh, I do support type threes. I think that in the reality of the size of this farming, it's actually not that huge of an agricultural industrial endeavor as we keep hearing. It's really necessary for the businesses that already exist in this county. Uh, I would also like to say I like parcel minimums for them because I like to keep them out of town. I don't think that everybody wants to see this on the side of our highways, and I think that that's something we can be respectful of. Thanks. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Evan Barrow from Hayford. I want to speak against the opt-out placed on Hayport. Um, I'm going to ask you to please remove the opt-out that's been placed on Hayport. I think that the R1, R2, R3 will keep the densely populated areas protected. Um, I do live in the water district. Um, I believe that having cottage size grows in the water district is compatible with the lifestyle and the culture of Hayport. Um, People are growing there now, small little hidden groves all over the place, along the river, here and there, and it doesn't seem to be creating a huge problem in the water district. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I just want to say one thing. I'm oh, sorry. You've already spoken? Okay. Yeah. Also, thank you. Brad and Tarbell at Hayfork. Um, I held a uh, county license under the urgency ordinance, um, and I support moving this permanent ordinance uh, along. Um, a lot of us have put a lot of time and resources into this, um, and it'd be great if we could have a shot at getting the state license when that comes on board. Um, I would also urge, um, as far as the setbacks to uh, neighboring dwellings, at least for the people that already had licenses, uh, please keep that the same um, because it would take a lot more time and resources to have to uh, change things from how they how they are currently are. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Roger Chatterton. I live in Trinity Center. This ordinance is related to resolution number 2016077, in which you laid out four principles of local regulation of cannabis to wit. Trinity County will be a safe place for all residents to live to work or enjoy retirement and raise their families, and the historical quality of life and natural environment in Trinity County will be protected and restored, and <laughs> cannabis cultivation in Trinity County will take place without environmental damage and without detriment to neighbors or communities, and Trinity County will regain its reputation as a popular tourist destination. 
We had resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Trinity hereby adopts the aforementioned four principles on local regulation of cannabis. This is 2016 September. This resolution is a normative public policy statement. It's a vision for the future of Trinity County. It's a statement of resolve to pursue that vision. In a greater sense, it's a reflection of the collective character of this board and you as the individuals who are privileged to serve on it. From a pragmatic standpoint, it is a roadmap of how to get where we need to go as a county. I ask that you deliberate and vote with prudence, responsibility, and wisdom that this resolution embodies. As a personal note, uh, I too live in Trinity Center and I request that Trinity Center and Coffee Creek districts both be opt-out areas. The North Lake area is not compatible with the cultivation of marijuana. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mike Ware, Hayport. Uh, I'll teach you when you guys get this first. Uh, counties, cities are not allowed to issue citations. California Penal Code, Chapter B, 5B, Citations and Violations of County, City, or County Ordinances, Section 853.1 through 853.4, enacted in 1955 was repealed in 1967. It has been illegal since 1967 for cities, counties, uh, ordinances to be enforced by pri on private property. County employees that are committing are committing domestic violence, uh, domestic terrorism, if they issue the citations under code violations, okay, on private property. Repeal means you can't do it anymore, okay? 12 years of lawsuits back this up. That's why it was repealed. Okay? So my question to you is, you're writing a, an ordinance, how are you going to enforce this? You know? You can't write a citation, because if you do, people out there writing a citation, they can be arrested. And they can go to jail for four years. Period. That's like the midterm on that one. And it goes on and gives you the actual, actual codes. So there. This is the law. This is law. This is an ordinance. Laws trump ordinances. Okay? And we have senators and representatives, they write laws, okay? This is not a law writing agency. This isn't, that's not your job. Your job is to guide, okay? Ordinances are for government properties, not for private properties. That's what they were made for, that's what they're designed for. In the state of California, same thing. Ordinances involve governing the government, not governing private properties. This goes as Dwayne pointed out, I guess Fifth Amendment. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Dewey Baird. I live in Trinity Center. I previously had uh, property elsewhere in the county, but I got kind of shoved off of it because of growers. Uh, Two points, and I'll try to make it brief. On 18 April 2011, I approached the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors with a petition endorsed by 125 of your constituents. It asked for two things. It asked for the county to undertake an environmental assessment of the past growth before you ever issue any permits for future growth. Remember this back in 2011. And the second thing was it asked that the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission undertake a minimalist position when drafting ordinances pertaining to cannabis. 
So those are the two points. I hope that uh, you know, they were officially presented at board meetings, and uh, hopefully you still got them in your record somewhere and not in round file. So I also found something interesting. It, it, it was to me. It may not be to you. But uh, the people at Trinity Center, Coffee Creek, and the environs do a lot of recreating. A lot of them are horse people or mule people. We also help the forestry keep the trails open in the spring. While researching some diseases, I did some studying about poisonous plants. Cannabis is one of them. It kills equines. Uh, it, makes, it makes them stupid. They run around in circles, and if they ingest enough of it, they die. In conjunction with that, a study in, in Nevada indicated that uh, honeybees, if they work on a large enough plot, they also die. So I'll let you form your own conclusions about that. Thank you. Thank you. I had a technical question clarification earlier. Can I make a brief statement? No, ma'am. Thank you. Public comment still open. Still open. Yes. I'm Ned Scott from Trinity Center, and I was involved in seven subdivisions in that area. I've seen it grow, and it's a real jewel in uh, in our area. It's nice. Um, we get a lot of people from the outside world in, in the summertime there. Suppose double our population, maybe maybe even triple sometimes. And so uh, people are drawn to that North Lake area. And so my first concern is um, that I would uh, ask the board to give consideration to uh, um, opting out the Trinity's North Lake area, perhaps Coffee Creek, if I uh, needed a boundary line adjustment, community services district would be a good place to start. And I have another concern, several other concerns. One is our water um, drainage is pristine. And I'm not so concerned about people here that grow, but the illegal ones that are over in the other side that have stepped across. I'm concerned about uh, keeping that uh, drinking water safe and secure. And one of one of our directors is here today, myself, and another one that just spoke. And we're very concerned about this. And the next thing, and this will be the last to know, get out of here before my time's up. I hope. But uh, this setback business. I feel that it's pretty nebulous the way it's proposed. I, I don't know of any um, building codes or ordinances that uh, are that don't reference uh, property lines. And I, I think it would be a, a good idea to have the distance for property lines, and then I'll tell you why. Here's a 10-acre parcel, and I have a little house up on the corner, this 10-acre parcel. And it's a two-bedroom house, and I'm saving my money to build a nice one <clears throat> down the corner, so I assume that's the parcel. Down the corner over here, <coughs> and, but I'm, I'm working for the county, so I don't make a lot of money. And so uh, it's taken me a little while. Well, along comes an uh, undocumented uh, pharmacist, and he plants some plants down here right next to the property line and it's more than the 500 feet up to my house. He's legal or the 400 feet or 350 or whatever is decided. <clears throat> okay, time goes on for a while and I, <clears throat> he's got his plants down there and I've got my little two bedroom um, house up there 
And the the thing that I'm concerned, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing right okay, is that what happens when I decide I want to build my nice house down with the view of the lake? I'm, I'm in trouble. Yeah, I, I, we know where you're going with that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My, my name is John Jason. I live in a small residential rural community on Eagle Creek Loop, up, uh, about four miles north of uh, uh, Coffee Creek area. Uh, my family's been here since the 60s. We've had property since the uh, 60s. They've lived here since the uh, mid-70s, and uh, I reside uh, in North County myself with my wife. Um, I have some very strong uh, feelings about uh, uh, commercial grows near residential and uh, recreational areas because I was a grower myself and know what impact it has to my neighbors and I did so for approximately 30 years in the central coast, uh, actually uh, in, uh, along the Salinas uh, River Basin. Um, as a grower there was nothing more important to me and as a grower there's no one nothing more important to any grower, no matter what the product is, than the product itself. If that's your livelihood, you will do anything to protect that. If you're infested with insects, you will spray a, a pesticide that's appropriate to eradicate that insect. I did so. If, they're, if you're infested with animals, you place poisons out if necessary to abate that problem. That includes strychnine and other chemicals that are extremely dangerous and extremely hazardous. If you, if you have infiltration from people and vehicles on your property, you take care of that situation as well, and you run them off. In order to do all above, I had to be permitted, licensed, and trained. I had to get the proper permits to apply the pesticides, to purchase the pesticides, the herbicides, the strychnine license, which was spe specific to poisons, all of the above had to be done in a proper way. I also had to be licensed. In order to get licensed in the application of any of those sprays, or they didn't have to be aerosol, they could be in other forms as well. I had to be licensed, in order to get licensed, I had to go to school. I had to go through the Ag Commissioner's office to get that schooling, the proper schooling, and I also had to be able to make sure that anybody working in my grow met all the standards that were necessary for personal protection use, that is respiratory, that is eye protection, that is wash stations including showers and eye wash stations in case there, in case there was a spill. It was mandatory that on this site I had a locked box at the location before you entered the property for CAL FIRE and the first responders to be able to come in, open that box, and find out what hazardous wastes were on that in case of a fire or in case of a spill. They need, needed to know what they were walking into. I don't see any of that taking place here. What I grew wasn't cannabis. I merely grew forage hay. Oat, wheat, barley, be it. That's what I had to comply to, and I was dealing with a product that didn't even get eaten by human consumption. It was an for animal use. And my rules were stringent. This should be above and beyond even those rules, and I believe that because of drift and because of application of chemicals, there needs to be as much as a two-mile buffer zone away from <laughs> residential Mr. properties Jason, to protect them because they're... Time, they're and I'm sure that probably Supervisor Gross can address your, your question or, or, or I can or Supervisor Morris after we're done. Or just talk about what's going on. If you can let somebody else speak, I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you. But, but stick around to hear what we have to say, especially regarding what you brought up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Kirk Connor, Hayfork. Uh, 
Yes, sir. I want to put forward an urgency feeling to pass this permanent ordinance. We need it in place to get our license at the beginning of the year. Please do so. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If you instead of clapping and get up and speak and let us know what you want. No, you can't again, but you did already. Stop. Screwing. You clapped for the roundabout, though, correct? We'll talk about it later. I've been through more than you have with the roundabout. Continue, sir. Thank you for coming along. Just see how long you wait. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Jim James. Again. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, talk about a few things that was just currently brought up. I wasn't going to come up, but um, uh, the dangerous chemicals, I bathe in it every day. Mine are uh, NOP compliant. I follow your feet, uh, all my products. There's nothing going into the groundwater at all. And of course, when you follow your feet, wind blows, and I get covered with it. Number one. Number two, animals eating their product. Um, smart animals won't eat per various products. I have horses, and I've had breeding horses in the past, and they don't seem to have any disturbing effects when they nibble at the product to see what they're what they're getting into. Haven't had any ill side effects. Uh, there's no dangerous products that go on my plants at all. Period. So um, a lot of this is just uh, misinformation that was given to them. Also, uh, another thing I want to talk about is private property should be sacred to people that own their own property. And as long as you're compliant to the law which is what we're trying to develop here, should be able to do with what you want on your personal private property. And once people give away their rights to own private property, just this is just a first step. It'll go on to the next thing and the next thing, and there won't be any private property in the future. But the problem is, is if there's no permitting, then what you're going to get is more of what you have now, which is 3,000 or so illegal grows. It's already been established here. And I would like to, as much as most all the people in this room would like to get rid of all illegal grows. I drink the well water. I mean, it's the best water that I've ever tasted. And it's 50 parts per million. It's clean. I want to keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again, everybody. My name is Stephanie Westover, and I'm from Feeling Groovy at Eagle Creek Ranch in Coffee Creek in Trinity County. And I wanted to say we're against the opt-out. Our ranch is a beautiful and classy guest ranch resort. Our price point caters to professionals and high-end clientele. We've already had many families, business owners, and people from the movie industry stay at our gorgeous ranch with great, fantastic Yelp reviews, so please take a look at that. Our first clients, which was amazing, were from Germany, so how did they hear from us if we have a declining business here in this county? I'd like to know. Um, we've had visitors from France and Dubai, so we have a diverse clientele that is wonderful, and they are looking not only to stay at the ranch, but they're looking to go fishing, and they're looking to go hiking, and horseback riding, and boating on the lake, and eating at the pizza restaurant. They're looking to go and go to the establishments, and the beautiful winery that we have. Everything in our community, they're visiting and they're putting their money to. Um, our ranch will bring much needed revenue and tourism to Trinity and Coffee Creek community. People that are involved in our ranch and our project include U.S. military veterans, motivational speakers, TV personalities, entrepreneurs, doctors, lawyers, college professors, educators, hotel owners, farmers, prestigious well-known ranchers, mothers, fathers, and people like you and I are coming to our ranch and visiting our community. Um, we're responsible, educated, and compliant we are looking forward to bringing much wealth and good people to the community, not hippies and Cheech and Chong like the fearful, ignorant locals are expecting us to bring into the community. As of recently, we have all received um, renowned community members that have come to visit our ranch out of curiosity from the local negative gossip to find that their complete, to their complete surprise as to the beauty and classy professional level that the ranch is being run and how nice we are, which is completely the opposite of what they were told by people 
who have never met us before or even visited the ranch. I have never before seen such a small group of people act so terribly and badly out of fear and ignorance. I've invited all of you, and I will invite all of you again, to please come visit us at the ranch and see exactly what we're doing. I also want to call to attention the fact that um, my husband, Mel, was walking our sheep from our far pasture and was harassed by a silver Ford F-150 with a pink trailer hitch that pushed our sheep and alpaca at a full run back to their enclosure. All I know is that, yes, it is a public road, but people and livestock, it is open range here in Trinity and Shasta counties. Please look up open range exception and what open range means livestock, sheep, cattle have the right of way over automobiles on public roadways and it means that a black cow at midnight has a greater right to stand in impassable we're, we're obstacle. Very familiar with what okay. open range and free so, range is. But thank you very much and thank you for your time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. My name is Eric Lono from outside of Hayfork. I would urge you to pass this ordinance so it gives protection for those people and keeps things moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Hi, I'm uh, Larry Fitzsimmons. Uh, I've been coming up here for about 30 years. 15 years ago, we bought some land and uh, built a home. Uh, subsequently, I joined the uh, fire department, I'm a medical first responder, uh, president of the board uh, on Coffee Creek Volunteer Fire. And so I'm part of the community that I'm talking about here. Uh, we came up here for the same thing that other people do, recreation, clean mountains, not a built up uh, place. Uh, and uh, I was rather pleased to see that Coffee Creek was included in the opt out. Uh, I feel that commercial growing and residential are incompatible. We already have an illegal grow on Eagle Creek Loop upstream from us. Uh, I don't know what poisons are going into the water, if poisons are going into the water. I do know that construction, earth movement, growing, all of that is going on without permits. And so it's hard to believe that, you know, uh, everything's going to be just wonderful on Eagle Creek Loop uh, if, uh, you know, they're allowed to grow there more. Um, the... Uh, Part of the problems are that we've already had intimidation on Eagle Creek Loop. We've already had a family threatened. And, you know, maybe it was someone flying off the handle, maybe not. But I think if you're going to be growing, go out and grow out in the, out in the outback. Um, I don't think I should have to have it in my backyard. I was, uh, I, I have nothing against uh, marijuana. Certainly it's here to stay. Uh, I just think that that's what zoning is all about. You zone certain things for certain areas, other things in other areas. Uh, anyway, I was, uh, I was pleased to see that uh, Coffee Creek is in the opt-out and uh, I, I think that's enough to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One more. Uh, my name is Barry Bowen. I'm from Coffee Creek. i um, been associated with Trinity County since, I guess, 1960. We've got the red and the blue shirts today. We've heard a lot of comments from either side. My only concern is to take care of Trinity County. This is the most beautiful reservation of area and diversified probably anywhere in the United States. And I don't want it to change. I think it's the responsibility of the, everybody or the 13,000 people that live here and the people that are govern the laws that the first thing that you think about is to preserving Trinity County and keep it like it is. It's just too much of a fabulous place 
to let it go one way or the other. So I just, I force you, ask you, plead with you that you take in Trinity County as a, one of the first parameters to think about before you make any decisions. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicole Lonnie, and I am the managing member of Feeling Groovy at Eagle Creek Ranch on Eagle Creek Loop. I'm really offended about some of the things I've heard today about our ranch. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm an NLP master practitioner trainer, and I have studied human behaviors, um, especially those that come from negative emotions. Our five most negative emotions that we deal with as humans are anger, sadness, fear, hurt, and guilt. And since I purchased that property and moved on to that property, I have felt four out of five of those things. I feel absolutely no guilt. But what I hear in this room is mostly fear. Fear of people that are uneducated or don't know. I can guarantee you that nobody at my ranch has ever made a threat to anybody else in this property. But it is really saddening to me that there are people that have come onto our property as soon as last week that tried to run over my staff member and her cat in a Ford 150 silver car. I, when I find the owner, I will report them to the police. We should not be worried about our lives on our ranch. We should not be worried about all this pettiness that's going on. Cannabis is here. It is here. We filed our water board, just to be clear, with everybody in Coffee, Coffee Creek and Trinity County on July 20th, 2017. Okay? Our intent card has been in for quite some time. We have not done anything that we're not supposed to. We have filed and we are moving forward. And we plan to keep moving forward. But what we can't have is hate mongers and fear mongers coming in this community and threatening people's lives. What I was gonna say today was something totally different. But when I have a team member of mine who is truly fearful, fearful for her life, shame on the people in Cal Coffee Creek. Shame on the hypocrites in this county. Shame on the people who are growing or have growers that work for them that are on this board. Shame on the people that that are on our planning commission, we pay taxes too. None of you have come to our property. None of you have seen what we brought, but you certainly are reaping the rewards of us bringing an economy into this community. We have had super wonderful people come to our property. Our property is pristine. There's no garbage, there's no trash, there's nothing on our property like that. So here's what I'm proposing. On October 14th, at one o'clock in the afternoon, I invite each and every one of you in this room to come to a barbecue. You can stay for the gossip as well, but come to a barbecue. My treat, come, see our ranch, see where we're growing cannabis, see that these truths are untrue, and see that we are loving people because everybody at Feeling Groovy Ranch treats people with respect, love, and integrity. We are not fear people. We welcome anybody at our ranch at all times. Thank you. Let's keep the clock again unless you're going to stand up and speak. Anyone else? Okay. My name is Suzanne Conrad. I live at 1364 Eagle Creek Loop. I live down downstream from an illegal grove. Um, I'm the treasurer of the Fireflies, which is a fundraiser for the Coffee Creek Volunteer Fire District, and we raise money through breakfast and pies and crafts. Uh, we donate approximately $8,000 a year to the to the fire district. One of the things we produce is the North Trinity phone book. Um, and 30 years ago, I fell in love twice. Once was with my husband where we wrote our vows up here, and the second one was I fell in love with Eagle Creek Loop. And um, it's been a love affair for 30 years. It's an amazing road. One time, uh, a, a, a river otter hopped out in front of me on the road when I was walking. Um, I've spent those 30 years swimming at the bridge, dry, riding our bikes with my grandchildren, the three of them down to the river at the bridge to swim. Now the place where we enter the bridge is a road to a grove. Um, I love to watch the sky at night. It's very dark there. We used to go down and put our our, I'm giving you a sense of what kind of a community this is. We used to put our, 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 our chairs right in the middle of the road and watch meteor showers. And one day, 
we were walking down in the pitch dark and ran into a bunch of people lying on their backs in the middle of the road in the pitch dark watching the video showers from from Ripple Creek cabins. This is the kind of a safe, quiet place that we chose to build and, and live. Um, after the ranch was sold in the recent past, we started hearing guns going off at night, yards from where those people were had been lying near near the road, and I no longer feel safe uh, having my grandchildren ride their bikes down that road. Um, they also love to play in the river down off of our property in the rift holes and, and we've named all the rocks and now it's downstream from a grill. I don't know what's going in the water. Are they safe? Is my well safe? Um, I think that life, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness applies here that we should have and I support the ordinance to um, <clears throat> have uh, an option to protect ourselves, our safety, our health, and our quality of life on you Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Kelly Gant, um, Community Center. And I want to thank you for all the hard work that you guys have done on the ordinance. I know this has taken years to get to this point today. Um, a few points. Um, I'm supportive of the opt-out for the Trinity Center CSD and the Coffee Creek Fire <coughs> Protection District. Um, as Mr. Scott had mentioned, we do have nine subdivisions in the Trinity Center CSD. Um, the districts are bordered on the west by the Trinity Alps Wilderness, which is the second largest wilderness in the state of California. It brings uh, people from all over the world looking for a pristine uh, recreational experience. And on the right, we have the, or the east, we have the National Recreation Area, uh, the Trinity Unit, and that is already a banned area for our commercial cannabis growing. Um, the Trinity Center CSD is a long CSD. At some points, there is only a half mile distance between the edge of the wilderness and the NRA. So it's a very long, um, thin district, and there's not a lot of space in between that isn't impacted by this unique forest um, recreation experience. Um, so therefore, I don't believe that commercial cannabis cultivation is compatible with that type of environment. Um, I also am opposed to the extension of the November 3rd grace period for anybody who wants to grow within those opt-out areas. Um, all farmers in the county have had over two and a half years to get a water permit. Um, I don't see any need for any additional time for uh, a select group of people. And then um, on the commercial ban itself, so the commercial ban will not stop a business or a resort from having a marijuana-friendly resort. I mean, it, that they can still have marijuana-friendly. They can have people bring their marijuana in. They can do activities that are legal and licensed. A commercial ban does not affect them. The commercial ban would affect a second source of income. The state law, as it's written now and looks like it's going to hold, um, doesn't allow you to gift marijuana. You cannot give it away, and you can't sell it um, uh, with a cultivation license. There's a process you have to go through. There's the three-tiered, and and so I don't see much benefit to growing commercially on a resort if you're already marijuana friendly actually have a commercial because there's nothing really you can do with that marijuana you grow unless you bring it back and then you can't give it away and you can't sell it. Um, so in that respect, I don't think there's that much impact. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Any other public comment? My name is Sam Lani. I'm uh, the owner of Eagle Creek Land Ranch. You know, initially when we came here, we had this wonderful idea of sharing some of the profits that we were going to make on canvas with our local community. Um, anyway, I don't want to talk about the economics. I don't want to talk about the, the, the fear. 
going to talk about something I think is probably the most important thing in this room. One part per billion pesticide. Could you have a vineyard with one part per billion? Probably not. Everybody who grows and everybody who doesn't grow in Trinity better remember that number. Because one part per billion is nothing. A little bit of wind and a little can of braid could destroy an entire hay fork. So I would say that within three years, there probably won't be any outdoor cannabis. I would be shocked if there was. Insurance companies are going to make you get rid of them, or at least the growers get rid of them, because insurance companies are not going to insure you. And growers need to be insured soon because they're part of the California regulatory bureaucracy under the health care. Cannabis cannot have any pesticides in it, contrary to belief of what we're doing. We don't use pesticides, and anybody who wants to grow pesticides on a professional level, I'd be growing cannabis, I'd be shocked if they're using any kind of pesticide. Um, one part per billion. Remember that. You need to regulate your 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 uh, future cannabis. Remembering that you should be having people in collectives. You should be putting people in greenhouses. Outdoor is gone. Anybody who's been growing outdoor in this county for the last 20 years has seen the price of outdoor cannabis in in the toilet. And if you think in 2018 you're going to get more than $800 a unit for outdoor, you're, you're you, I, I, I hope for you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Is there any additional public comment? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Michelle Coleman. I am a resident and a business owner in Copper Creek. Uh, my husband and I have been coming to the Trinity Alps for the last 30 years. And we came because, and we always have been here, because it's one of the few undisturbed, pristine wilderness areas in California. Ripple Creek Cabins has been in business for over 40 years. We bought the property 23 years ago and continue to run the business. We employ two full-time staff, and they're very active in the community. One is on the school board, one is in the volunteer fire department, they have two kids that are school age. They go to Coffee Creek Elementary School. Many of my guests have been coming to Ripple Creek for over 30 years. Our guests have always felt that they're safe and they like to bring their children, their grandchildren, and they enjoy many activities that Trinity County has to offer. Our guests spend money also while they're here. They too shop at stores, they dine out, they go to the lake and boat, and they also go to local wineries. My concern, imagine that, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> That's Keith, yeah, really. <laughs> My concern is the effect of marijuana production of polluting pristine rivers and streams, disturbance of the land right at the river's edge, the abundance of chemicals used in the proximity of the family recreation sites and waterways, increased fire hazards, and an inevitable changes in the atmosphere that this type of business brings. We now have an illegal grow next door to us. My guests are hesitant to book next summer, and I'm getting comments like, instead of rebooking like they usually do, they're going, well, maybe we'll just see what happens next door, and then we'll decide. Bottom line is, decrease in tourism equals less money to Trinity County, and it also means a decrease in the active community members that are very vital to this community. Illegal or legal growing in residential or business communities is not compatible. And I do strongly hope that you consider the opt-out for Coffee Creek. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? If not. Tom Fielding, A4. Um, just a few things. One, I, I'm for the ordinance to be passed. Um, I think it's a great starting point, and, and it would be ideal to get something on the books. 
it's not inclusive of everybody that would like to be involved in the program, but that could slowly change over time. And, um, you know, the reality is we're talking about four or 500 permits out of already acknowledged seven, 8,000 rows or whatever in the county, at least 6,000. And the truth is, is this is a limited percentage of people that, that are doing this in the county. And most likely, the people that want to get clean as far as what they're doing environmentally. And from both sides of the aisle here, obviously we're all here in Trinity County because we want a pristine environment and we all love the mountains and it's a small community. So there's common ground here. You know, I, I'm not going to talk about type, type three much. I, I, I'm a fan of small cottage permits. But everybody needs to remember that from here on out, even for the people that are in the permit process, this is an uphill battle. There's not money falling out of people's pockets. You know, there's permit fees everywhere. Everybody's trying to get their chunk of change. And, um, you know, we need to look at the long-term goals of the community. And somebody else said it already, I think this gentleman right here, is let's put, you know, Trinity County first, because I think that's probably the responsible, respectful thing to do for whatever side you're on, on this particular um, agenda. We all want to live in a pristine environment. We all want to raise families here or be here in that environment in the next decade or two or three. So um, I think it's a valuable program for the community. I think it's a good starting point. But I also, you know, want to, you know, you, we should all be hesitant thinking that there's all this extra money from these people or that doing anything to, to not allow these 500 permits is somehow going to fix the environmental degradation. There's been more than just cannabis coming through this county for hundreds of years all over the West doing environmental degradation. And the question is, is as a community moving forward, whether it's cannabis or another resource, how do we want to approach that resource and what do we want left in our community, monetarily wise, resource wise, respect wise? the people and the environment so I think we should move forward with it and I think it's a good starting point and I think those are the things that as a community no matter what side of this you're on you, you should keep in mind so that as a community we have a plan moving forward that has an agenda for the people for the environment and for keeping our area um, thriving thank you Hello, Kevin Manassi at Hayfork. Thanks you guys for all your work. You guys know we need this ordinance. Gets us all on the same page. Gets us legal, gets rid of the bad guys. A few observations. I noticed at lunch a lot of you guys went to the golf Kevin. course. Sorry, keep it up here. Thank I wonder you. if they were worried what they put on the lawn at the golf course over there like they are what we put on our plants. I went back there and looked at the stuff they showed me. We couldn't use any of that stuff they use. What I use in my garden Kevin. for pesticide, sorry, Diatomaceous food grade, diatomaceous earth. That, along with predatory bugs, companion crops which drive away bugs, they track bugs and all the birds and frogs and wildlife going crazy in our grove are eating all the bugs. We have no problems. For mold, we use hydrogen peroxide. I use it for mouthwash in the morning. It's definitely not toxic. Our fertilizer is organic tea made it into water so the plant can absorb it right away. We don't want our nutrients going, wasting all over the place. So we're not polluting, you guys. The bad guys that were here before, yeah, they did. We're trying to do better for that, okay? So that's pretty much where I'm at. We're not hurting everybody. We're going to make it better for everybody. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> I'm John Brower from Junction City, and I want to echo what Kevin just said about the, the robust environmental protections uh, in the state licensure system, the Department of California Department of Pesticide Regulation has a big hand in this, and uh, this is really a moment for Trinity County to show the rest of the world how to do this right. The original urgency ordinance was really a beautiful compromise from all these different viewpoints in our wonderful county, and, and in the, the spirit of that, uh, uh, I would encourage you to pass this ordinance today and uh, move forward. We have to move forward immediately if our hardworking farmers are going to have even a chance in this new wide market. 
the white market starts January 1st. First issue licenses will be issued January 2nd. To not be able to participate in that is folly. It would be the, uh, a tremendous opportunity missed. So I would like to see this pass today, and and I would like to see all these conversations continue over time. We can we can massage this thing and and uh, tailor it to fit our needs in our different communities. And uh, I think it's wonderful everybody's participating. And, and the the addition of the larger grows, I uh, I was strongly against that in the beginning, um, but in light of Alma and Macursa and what's happening in the rest of the state, I think a limited number of them and a, a pilot program type way is appropriate right now. And uh, like I said, we need to do this right and we need to do this right now. Thank you. Thank you, John. Is there any additional public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Alec Hurst with Hurst Family Farms, and um, I'm a permitted farmer here in Trinity County. And I'd like to just add to what John and Kevin said. Um, I would do anything to save my garden and get my product to the shelves, but the last thing I'd do is put poison or anything harmful on, on that product at all. Um, we're under big time scrutinization. You need to speak to me. Uh, we're under big time scrutinization for everything that we do. And uh, basically, we don't use any pesticides. All our stuff is pretty much 100% organic. And uh, any pesticide, or we don't have any pesticides, any sprays that we use, I mean, you can go pour a cup of it and drink it yourself. So I just wanted to say the last thing that, that I would do is put anything harmful on my product at all. And I think I speak for a lot of us when I say that. So I just wanted to say, uh, let's get this thing passed and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any additional public comment? Hello, board. My name's Brandon. Now, I'm an employee at Eagle Creek Ranch, and I'm against the opt-out. Um, our grow, you know, it's almost a mile away from Ripple Creek. So I just wanted to make that known. And we don't put pesticides and stuff on our plants to go into the creek water that we drink. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. I'm Chris from Coffee Creek. And, uh, yeah, obviously, we're all up here for the same reason. All the growers want to protect the environment. That's why we want the permits. We want to do it right. Um, and just the economic impact. I mean, we're part of this community. We put <laughs> almost all of our money goes back into this community. We spend our money at Tops. We spend our money at the pizza place. And we really do provide a lot of money that comes back into this community. So it's not just the tourism that, uh, that you have to look at. And uh, in terms of the op, uh, opting out areas, just wanna say I think it totally makes sense if you're in a cul-de-sac and in a smaller community, yeah, your small community doesn't want it, but this area encompasses a lot of space that we're talking about. And when you're out, a mile away from anyone, no one can see you, no one can smell you, then what is the harm in being able to have a legal operation out there where you're not impacting anyone? Thank you. Thank you. Would, would, Stand the, up, please. Sorry, would the ranch, Eagle Creek Ranch, be grandfathered in under the current proposed language? Okay, I'll accept that. Let's answer that. Well, we'll, we'll answer those questions. Okay, thank you. On my list. Okay, it's on your list. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jerry Fournier. I own the Coffee Creek Country Store. All of these people are my friends on both sides. I think this, uh, this issue is really driving a wedge between our communities of Trinity Center and Coffee Creek. I do believe that cannabis is a new industry for the area, as was tourism, lumber, gold, all of those things. I think that we need more education because I think both sides are 
under the wrong impression. One side is being defensive, the other one is being um, uh, feeling like they're being uh, excluded. And I think you had a, uh, a mention of having a workshop for a traffic light. How about a workshop for Trinity Center and Coffee Creek, where all of these people can really just talk to each other, find out what it is they're doing, what it is that they don't want done. I think we have to have a meeting of all of these educated minds. People are misinformed. People are, are, um, are feeling, again, like I said, uh, put on the outside. And I, I think that um, it could be a good thing for Trinity County. It would bring money in because if you let people get their licenses and let them do what they're supposed to do or whatever, you could have them taxed. You didn't have uh, money for all of these issues with the fire. You didn't have money for your, your uh, security, your police department, which my husband Larry was on. Um, you know, it's, to me, this hurts my feelings that, you know, some of these people are going to look at me because I guess maybe I am a pro-cannabis because I think it's, I, a new industry where people will be able to feed their families, buy a car. There's jobs offered here. There's taxes offered here. I think it can improve. But I also don't think in Trinity Center everybody should have grows in their backyards. That is not at all right. But I think in the, the bigger areas or away from uh, residences, let it bring money into the community because the ones you don't want are the ones that are out in the woods destroying our natural resources and things. And now I'm going to get emotional, but you know, everybody needs to sit down and talk about this so you make a good decision. You need to have all of the facts. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is there any additional public comment? See, see. <coughs> we have additional Hi. Hi, my name is Jim Coleman, and I own Myrtle Creek Cabins right next door to Healy Groovy. And yes, there is animosity between us and them, and it started with 50 shots shot every night right next door to our cabins to scare away our guests. I guess. I don't know what they were for. And I don't know what. Ripple Creek, uh, look, Eagle Creek has. You know, they have no permits to grow. They have no permits for any of their building projects that I'm aware of. They have no permits for their commercial kitchen. So I don't know what they're giving back to the county. And yes, they have threatened our neighbors' lives. Okay? That's it. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the board. Okay. Hold up, I got something to say. Get in line. Hi, I'm Sue Riso from Lewiston, and I just have one comment. I'd like to encourage you to include the opt out areas. And my reason being, um, a couple years ago, my neighbor had a cat. It was fine, it was next door, it was fun going petting the cow. If my neighbor put in a dairy farm, I would have a problem. Yeah, so um, I'm encouraging you to keep the opt-out areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're up. And anyone else, get your tail in here. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to speak because I've been going to these meetings several times. I feel like I might as well. Um, I'm sure you've heard it all, but I am for keeping the opt-out areas. I feel like the people that had their chance in those areas. They had an opportunity to get their water board. This is a give and take situation and there's people here that don't want that and I think they had their chance. Um, I also would like to kind of point out that there's been a lot of misinformation going along. Um, we were issued a permit which we know through cancel is no good at this point but you have people like Chadwick here doing whole page ads in the newspaper saying that 
don't worry, your permit's still good, and the county can, or it should be accepted, and it should be good. And I just would like to point out that me and my family have been uh, scared. And we signed up for something, and we paid some money, and uh, we've done the right thing, and we'd like to continue to move forward. We've invested a lot of money, and I feel like this urgency ordinance was a good thing, and I feel like it was pretty childish the way that it got canceled, and uh, I would like to get back on track so we can get back with the state and uh, continue to move forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the board. Thank you all for being here and also commenting. Uh, I think, uh, shall we start with uh, answering some questions? Yeah, I think we have some board, questions. Board, do we have any technical questions? Um, I have technicals, but I can start wherever you would like to sure. um, Let's deal with public comment first. Keith, you have a list going over there? Yeah, there actually wasn't a lot of questions. Um, so we have, I'm just going to go down the list as I, so we had a question of enforcement and that that uh, we don't, we couldn't pull the plants and there's no enforcement. So under 8A, violation of this ordinance constitutes a nuisance and is subject to fines and abatement pursuant to ordinances 8.64 and 8.90 of the trade County Code. So there is enforcement in this and I will point out that uh, we've uh, moved $350,000 into enforcement uh, in the current budget. And it's, uh, well, that's what it is. And, and as if this program grows, we'll have more money to bring in enforcement. Uh, but $350,000 in Trent County is a lot of money to, to pull in. Um, the fees going up, there was a question about the fees. Remember, fees are not taxes. These are actual costs that we have to put back. So uh, by the end of this, I believe this is still in here, that we would have to do a fee study and either uh, raise our fees or lower the fees, uh, depending on, on what we do. Uh, taxes that go into the general fund uh, would have to be just that, and taxes. Um, I know we'll skip to tying taxes to the, the ordinance. Uh, Supervisor Chadwick and, uh, is, I believe, still working on the tax um, ordinances that we're going to be hopefully moving forward on it sometime soon. Uh, Just to let you know that the fees that we collect have to stay within the permitting process. They do not go into general fund. They do not pay for uh, law enforcement or anything else. They have to stay there. We did have a taxation, excise tax brought forward earlier a few months ago and it uh, didn't have enough votes to pass. So it would be, it would be nice. So then we'll move into the, the CEQA question. Uh, unlike okay. what has been talked about, we are in the midst of CEQA. We plan to have a CEQA finished by January 1 to protect the growers uh, and the county uh, in this. Uh, we don't have a timetable when this is gonna go forward, but it's close to being finished and we'll answer uh, the state's CEQA questions. Um, then we had a question about, you know, one acres being agribusiness um, and being very large. Uh, I will just say, as being 42 years in agriculture, you would be laughed out of any agricultural county in the state if somebody said that agribusiness is one acre. Uh, so in, in my world, agribusiness or one acre is, is not industrial farming. Uh, that, that is my opinion. Uh, we have, in this whole process, have leaned towards the small growers and the small Trinity County growers that have been here. That's been our whole goal. And I think we've done as good a job as we can on that. Um, and so that's all I'll say about that. I have a note that Liz asked, and I'm not understanding my own note. Sorry about that, Liz. Next. 
Next page. Um, I would ask council to uh, study the legal question that got brought to us today and give the ad hoc a update on the truth of that. And we also had questions on in the, in the large grows raising the setbacks, and I, I think that's probably a, a good idea. Uh, we wanted to hear discussion from people out there uh, on, on the, the parcel size. What we didn't want to do is have somebody that has a few acres just wasting time trying to get variances put through. We wanted to set some sort of minimum, but I think it's, <coughs> it does make sense to raise that up. Point out, to, and, and this is, I, I appreciate all the, the growers in here that talk about using diatomaceous earth and these things, and I think that's wonderful and where this industry is going to go. Uh, and I, I truly do believe that that's what's happening in, in a percentage. But I think we, we cannot, and I don't think the grow community can turn their back on the fact that the latest study in July in Los Angeles were 93% of the organic, pesticide-free cannabis in legal dispensaries had toxic levels of, of chemicals on them. So, I mean, you guys are doing great. I appreciate that, but we still have to keep that focused in on protecting people. To add to that study, if you were to try and sell that cannabis to a, a, a retail outlet, you would not be able to would not be able to do it in Colorado, I believe. And after the first of next year, you won't be able to sell it. We, we really hope so. <laughs> so, um, and then the question came up on, uh, since we talked about the, the, uh, the opt-out parts of this, um, and if your water board was in before uh, we say November 31st, uh, then you would be grandfathered in. So that answers your question there. Um, and without residency? Then no, we... Oops. Move forward. I'm going to answer that. Okay. So... <laughs> I'm glad you're chair. I'm glad you're chair next year. So, no, the question is, is that you could uh, apply for a license if you don't have legal residency or you don't meet any other qualifications, you've just reached one hurdle. So, no, if you don't have residency the one year, then you would have to wait for your one year residency. And you would have to comply with everything else. That's just one, one part of going. Um, so, I think that was mainly the questions. I mean, we heard a lot of statements, and I respect them all. And there just wasn't a lot of questions about, about the ordinance that I saw. Right. Do you want to just, um, I guess we'll have to do that. You covered the CEQA issue fairly well. Okay. Um, so the couple things I wanted to address, um, someone earlier, before we took a break, you know, tried to address our statement on the staff report of no fiscal impact or little. It's relating to this county budget. So it's not overall looking at the fiscal impact. It's regarding the county budget. Um, some of the issues that were brought up from a, an article really is about the unregulated <coughs> market we've had for 20 plus years as, as a result of not having regulations when 215 passed. And so um, I think that's what this ordinance has been trying to do since we embarked on this since fall of 2015. And many of you have been attending those meetings since and, and have heard the various conversations that have gone on. Um, including planning commission meetings. So I would also agree, uh, we heard in some of our public workshops over the last few months, um, the, the need for the type three license um, of up to one acre grows. Uh, that came out of some of the, the, like I said, workshops we had. Um, 
there is some deadlines uh, that people need to meet and people need to think about scaling up into the white market and um, we had always intended to look at type 3 uh, licenses early on uh, there just wasn't um, enough information out there and since uh, we've taken some workshops on the road that's some of the issues we heard along with um, some of the addressing the Hayfork Water District which was out then in and then out so um, just want to make that clarification the other clarification I really wanted to make is you know there's a lot of this framework is still uh, intact what everyone's used to our ones our twos our threes are still ban zones um, in addition to the special district areas that have been opted out so there still is some protection in there we haven't taken that away um, let's see Margaret do you want to since we um, are kind of forced on this different path if this was an urgency ordinance we we pass it or not today and then move on but we have to take this other uh, path uh, according to law could you explain that to the public of some of the time frames we have to jump through um, taking this path is already probably having to cost us 90 days delay but go happy to provide that but with an urgency ordinance it's passed after an initial reading and it's supposed to move effect immediately with a uh, regular ordinance or a permanent ordinance, which is what this is, it needs to have a first reading, then a second reading, which is five days, at least five days later, and then it goes into effect 30 days after passage. Uh, and that would be the timeline we are dealing with for this ordinance. Is there any publication? There will be a publication during that period of time. Yes, during the period of those 30 days. Thank you. Um, I think, I was trying to think if there's anything else. That, that's it. I, I think I will go a little bit more into the sequel. We did, there was a question, you know, who gives us the authority to uh, not do a sequel with this? Um, well, it was the state legislator that gave the legislation that gave us the authority to, to do this. But again, we still plan to have this by the, the first date of uh, July, the first of uh, July, January. January. Not if not sooner uh, and then there is a question about what happens if we some date in the future uh, change the ordinance which of course any changes with the ordinance would have to meet a CEQA uh, upgrade uh, if it was if you said okay we're gonna allow 10,000 permits it would be a full-blown EIR if you were gonna do one permit more it probably wouldn't so someplace in between there is a difference between a full EIR and, and a negative declaration um, so once the negative declaration comes out there'll be comment period for agencies and people to uh, mm -hmm. say if it's a good or a good sequel or not and then from that point we will move on okay, I think that's it for clarification questions for staff I, um, I speak to, spoke to uh, Mr. Little after the letter and then um, also Adam regarding the CEQA. And let's see, correct me if I'm wrong, we are finishing up, or the CEQA data has been compiled and it's in, in review, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, when I was talking to him, he uh, indicated, Adam, I'm sorry, I forget his last name right the second I looked it up, that that was not adequate and that we would be needing additional CEQA. I asked them specifically if um, farmers would have to do their own CEQA, and he said it was a case-by-case -case situation. Can you comment at all as an environmental person? I, I think uh, I'd like to kick it over to Marva because she's been coordinating with Derek. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. So for the purpose of this ordinance, uh, SB 94 allows us to avoid that question and gives us the opportunity to make sure we have the right answer to that. Uh, the letter that was drafted and provided is not accurate on all fronts. And so we have a specialized CEQA attorney who we will be reviewing it with, and they'll come up with an answer and provide it to the board and to the public as to what specifically our recommendations is going forward on CEQA. But again, at this point, going forward today, because we have this exemption that's been provided under SP94, which we're utilizing under our CEQA, 
that's not a question we need to deal with today, but it will come before you in the future. Um, I don't necessarily believe, and I know um, Mr. Blanco spoke to this in his public statement as well, that everything in that letter is accurate. Um, but again, it was provided to us at, at 5 o'clock after hours um, before this board meeting, and so we haven't worked with our consultants and our specialized CEQA attorney to come up with an exact response. But it's not going to be as um, black and white as they, as they state. Well, I'm glad that you saw the SB 94, and I, I'm glad you're referring to that, but there is a date of July of 2019. <coughs> So um, since the last CEQA took a while to get going and we had a head start because Mr. Tippett had um, started with it in the Rose Department, I believe, for a separate re reason. But I just want to make sure that the farmers know that there's the potential that they may, case by case, uh, according to Department of Fish and Wildlife, have to have their own CEQA as well. <coughs> and um, there's a rating for that. I'm sure they can talk to them. Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, going back to uh, Sam from Lewiston, I'm glad that you read that article, Sam. Um, we as a board do have options. Uh, I don't know if you've had time to read the trailer bill. Prior to the trailer bill, I don't see you, so I'm just going to talk to the audience. Um, 133G, the licensing authority. This is also SB 94, trailer bill 133. Um, uh, basically, it comes down to this. It's very long. Um, you can, it's ordinance section 26200. There's multiple locations. You can read it for yourself. So we can appoint someone to be the authority in Trinity County that when the state contacts us, that if you're already licensed, that there is no reason why you would not continue to be licensed until that expiration date. So that was an accurate statement if our board chose to do that. We can roll over those that are in um, the waiting period that haven't finished as well. So those were accurate uh, assessments, Sam. I want to jump back to the process, Margaret, with you as far as uh, the Planning Commission um, that happens on August 28th, um, the special meeting. Let's see if I can pull it up. I had corresponded with you. Um, I had some concerns because it was presented to the Planning Commission without uh, District 3 representation. Unfortunately, Diane had to have surgery. Um, and there were multiple things. And just to refresh your memory on the agenda for the Planning Commission, uh, the first number four states that Trinity County Board of Supervisors seeks input from the Planning Commission. I don't have any record of that happening. The second number four states that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Trinity State of California hereby finds and declares as follows. Again, I don't have any record of this happening. Number five, page three, states that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Trinity hereby finds and declares the following. Again, we did not do it. Um, later, there is a reference to minutes dating back to May 25th of 2017. However, there were no minutes included in uh, the agenda and or on the Trinity County website, nor is there to date. So how can anyone choose to verify the accuracy check? Um, I never received any yeah, inputs. My concern here is that, uh, once again, procedurally, we are not following a process um, which ties into where I'm going to next. Mr. Seifer, as, long, as well as many other people in the audience, brought to our um, attention the Trinity County zoning, zoning Ordinances, as well as the General Plan. Um, the Hayfork General Plan clearly states in Chapter 8 that not only can we, um, I would like to read it accurately, if I can find it. Uh, we have the right to cultivate agriculture and that we can uh, dry flowers and even make medicine, which clearly uh, cannabis falls into. And yet we are taking out one of the few areas in Hayfork that we have measured water. So again, it's a procedural question. How did we get to this place where we're not following our own procedures? Chapter 8 of the Hayfork Community Plan is economic development, and it clearly defines resource-based activities as including agriculture. And it even lists act, just so you know, before uh, timber and mining. So these are all procedural type of questions that I have before we actually get into the ordinance itself. Quick, 
follow-up, two follow-ups. Uh, mm -hmm. Has the Hay for Community Plan been adopted? In, in 1996. Oh, okay. There was one that was done yeah. just about three or four years ago, and that's the one I, I refer to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what Supervisor Chadwick brought up regarding the CEQA expiration, you mentioned 19, or uh, what year? July 2019. 19, is, is that correct? That's right. Okay, that's I, I was wondering whether there was one in 17. Page 3, paragraph well, 7, just, the last just, sentence. I just wanted to make sure that was it instead of the one I thought was 17. Which would be even more dangerous. Uh, I, I think the the conclusion that the county can just wait and let people in is incorrect. Right. Okay. Uh, so you, that, you have a couple I, questions, I, I, the I, supervisor. Yeah, that's correct, and I'd like to answer them. You make sure I, I hit all your, your questions. I believe your first one was a question about why the planning commission was reviewing a proposed, proposed ordinance that had not been passed by the board of supervisors. Is that, was that correct? Uh, if you if you go to the agenda um, for the Planning Commission, it is presented as though we gave direction to the Planning Commission that night. So it's so when you're dealing with any land use based ordinance, there's a requirement before the Board of Supervisors to consider that it does have to go through the Planning Commission in order to get them their get their <coughs> input on it. So it, it is not something we can avoid. It's something that has to be done. Uh, the, the ordinance that was attached to the proposed the staff report is a proposed ordinance that staff placed there. It was not signed or approved by the board. It's merely proposing language that would come back to the board, which is here before you today, similar to what was attached to your board of supervisors' agenda. That's done. Did, did we not give direction, I'm sorry, Bobby, back in, was it August, uh, about three years ago, two years ago, at the TPAC? Yes, there was multiple times the board have asked, and has asked to, to have us go through the planning, because again, right. they're required to have it go through planning. Right. So a board, even though you we weren't sitting, did request well, it, this. It brings up the, day, the SB 94 and other things that are current now that our board did not give direction on. So if you if you just simply look at the planning and go to it, and like I said, it, if you want to look at where it says the minutes, and it's it's saying that it's in it, the minutes are not provided and they're not provided still on the website that you're referring to. The, which minutes are the ones where the Board of Supervisors directed staff to put it on the Planning Commission? The minutes on the agenda for the special 28th mini, meeting, there it says none. And, and then you're referring to other minutes in these items, and there are no minutes on the Sorry. agenda. Hello? On the Board of Supervisors agenda? No, this is the planning. This is all referring back from the planning. Well, I don't have that in front of me, so you're going to have to walk me through exactly what you're um, you can You can just go to TrainingCounty.California, look at the August 28, 2017 special. <coughs> and your problem is, is that there are no minutes. I, I'm to trying to understand you. the procedure of how, how when it is put before the planning commission and it states that it is directed from us when we didn't direct it. There is one item that it says that ad hoc proposed. I understand that. I believe that that's accurate. And then it, it tells you to go to the minutes, and the minutes are not provided. And there are no minutes provided anywhere. So the minutes for the August 27, 2017, 28, 28, 2017 have not been approved by the Planning Commission. Uh, when they are, they will be uploaded. It's in the agenda. They're referring to previous minutes that are not posted in the docket or on the agenda. Which one specifically? Are you sure that I, there's, there were many pages of them. This is our problem. Sorry. It's all of ours. It's all of ours. <laughs> well, well, we are we trying to figure out so. it? It took a long time to load them up. Shh. If, if you can tell me the specific dates, because I do have them on my phone here. <clears throat> okay, so back on May 25th, there, there's a, a reference to the minutes from dating back to May 25th. However, there were no minutes. And by the way, the May 25th 
if I read from, remember correctly, was when um, the <laughs> ticket said that the minutes that the Board of Supervisors were going to be provided on June 20th in the um, <coughs> video form, and I have not since then ever received any minutes. Would, I would, would you mind looking at my computer, because I do have the May 25th, 2017 minutes as part of uh, what's on the website. <coughs> So I, I guess that is where my confusion arises because online the only date that we don't have minutes for is that August 28th because of course it's not say when it was posted. I will be opening it up right now. I'm opening it right now, but I don't know. I think you're saying it doesn't say when it was posted. I'm not sure. Right after it, after it, before it happened, I wrote it to you on Friday, August 25th. And, and it, I, they are posted, and I will hand them right now. They're on the website. Um, I didn't take any direction to post them after your letters, but my assumption is it was done before. But I would have to check with planning staff with the one that does that. So I, I checked it the day it was. And, and Carol, you said you saw it. They're posted. Yeah, yeah they were posted. <laughs> I'm sure Carol was the PC. I have a very slow internet. Took them a long time, but they came up. Direction was given. <laughs> discussion about the process. The process, of course, we involve working with that on committee, then going in, and then the direction was to go through the signing, which again is required for all land use ordinance, and then to bring it back in for supervisors. So you're going back to October 2015? Yes, that's when direction was given, but also again, the law requires us to go to the planning commission before bringing the board of supervisors, so we can't bypass that even if the board had given us specific directions. I think there's some confusion as you might have pointed out that some of the not some growers would have to do their own CEQA um, that was our argument uh, knowing that our CEQA was going to be around the corner that was one of our arguments to keep the urgency ordinance going that has a different process the way council is talking about in terms of processing a land use ordinance so if this was an urgency ordinance today, we could just pass it and be done with it. Because we had to switch into a normal ordinance, it requires, as council stated, it to go in front of the planning commission, then to the board. So that's, yeah, that's where, where I'm saying that it, it went before the planning commission, and it appears that we sent it this board, not the 2015 board. And so procedurally, I'm asking, for that reason, because it doesn't refer it back, plus the minutes were missing on, at, at the time I wrote you after the agenda had been posted. Um, but that aside, also going forward procedurally, um, you have stated to me on several occasions, and I, I um, sent this to, with a letter with Mike Ware on the day of the special meeting. Um, you counseled me, and I stopped going to the PC meetings because you told me that it would jeopardize my vote. I also uh, pointed out that you had uh, said that to John Brower, had specifically said that to me, and um, we had talked about it, and I, I would get my own videos, and I pointed out to you before the meeting that Mike McHugh had been at the August 15th um, all day, and that I had concerns. I just want to know why there seems to be a double standard, why I'm not allowed to go to the Planning Commission and, and Mr. Bauer cannot go to the Board of Supervisors meeting, but Mike McHugh can. Chair, would you respond? Yes, you can. I want to make it very clear that I do not advise individual board members or individual Planning Commissioners on the legality of whether they have a conflict or not. That's what the FPPC does. 
what I would have told you and what I believe I told you is that if you do attend a planning commission meeting, you are required to publicly before the Board of Supervisors announce that you attended that meeting and then describe everything that you have learned at that meeting. And of course, that's a, an onerous task and it's not something that I anticipate you want to do and, and you made a decision to cease going to them, it sounds as if. Uh, I do not recall having a conversation with your Bauer. If I did, it probably would have been a similar statement of talking about um, making sure that you contact the FPPC and get some individual opinion on that and that I don't advise specifically on that. But it's important to be open and uh, disclose um, if you attended. The difference between the, the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors is they're advisory. They're not sitting in a judiciary capacity or make, rendering a quasi judicial <coughs> decision. I mean, they're not making the decision, they're just giving their opinion, which you can take or not take. So there's a little bit of a different standard in terms of what is applied to the Planning Commission versus what's applied to the Board. But again, that's not something that I would advise on, that's something I would direct you or an individual to go to the FPPC and make that determination. That's somewhat what you said, but not exactly. Um, so, how is it that we used to be the Planning Commission Board? So We are getting way off topic This is here. all yeah. has to do with the August 28th special if you just meeting. Want to vote, we're looking no, at vote, the no. ordinance. Of, this ordinance came out of that meeting, and I want to make sure that going forward, that we can go forward on it, and okay. it's all procedural. Basically, what you want to do is, is discredit the current No, procedure. I want to know why there are double standards. Well, you were explaining just a moment ago that there wasn't on the Planning Commission, so what's our next I can't, I'm here? sorry, I can't hear you. Well, let's just explain there aren't double standards on the Planning Commissioners. Uh, so what's the next double standard that we're going to get? Well, I want to know then if there's a Board of Supervisors and we used to be the Planning Commissioner, how does that standard change now that we have a Planning Commission? Actually, it's I just think, a question. I, and I don't think we have an answer to that because we don't have that situation right it, now. Historically, we're, we're with, with this item, I had a, a, my person could not be there, and I had to try to find someone that had not been at the August 15th in order to be able to participate in an inner way, and he was told no. I'm you, trying to find out why. I asked those questions through him that I may have not been answered. So. I guess there's a misunderstanding. The commissioner is not your commissioner or my Correct. commissioner. Correct. The, the board as a whole appoints a commissioner. And the board as a whole normally respects the commissioner of, or the supervisor of that district and allows them to pick, but they don't have to. They can say no. Correct. So once you're a commissioner, there is a process and a commissioner would have to step down before they can be appointed. There's not we don't have alternate commissioners. And so uh, just like District 4 is not being represented because they, there is no person there, unfortunately, of course, was sick that night. And, Surgery. Okay, I don't want to get into personal stuff, but so we can't shut the county down for a month or five weeks or whatever it is because one person has a problem. If that person resigned and then you found another commissioner <coughs> forward, that process could start. So that would have been an easy explanation that night. That's what she said. That what? Well, like I said, I have not received my minutes. I have not received the video. So I don't know. I wasn't present. Well, I'll tell you, I did provide that. Uh, Almost identical statement. Thank you, you learned well. Any <laughs> 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 technical questions? Yeah, um, okay. you're going to want to go back to your 1,173 page because that's how I have it. Okay, are you looking at the attachment? 
Yeah, staff report. Ad hoc committee process the following amendment to the new repeal emergency ordinance. Uh, the second one, it says only the BOE seller permit is required as opposed to all the other items listed on section 3 um, BIII. So uh, the other restrictions made it uh, more clear for a pathway on the white market and on just the BOE seems like it's leaving a door open to the um, black market and I was wondering why that had happened. That was a carryover from when we brought the urgency ordinance to the board for renewal. So that was there then and we we're just repeating it here. There was some duplication in uh, that item so we just streamlined it to um, the BOE. Right, there was there was strikeouts, but there was like if I remember right, there was four or five things. So and it was duplicated later. Right. So, so we I cleaned it up is what our and you reduced it to just this one and that's what I'm asking. How so so basically in the four items, BOE was one of the four items. So if we required a BOE and then it's one of the four items, then everybody just used the BOE and didn't come didn't do the other three items because we did, it was an oversight on our part in the first time. Um, and so mm -hmm. instead of leaving that in, it, it seemed kind of silly because we only needed the BOE and that's all we were using. Right, so the next one and the same thing is, has, has to do with the opt-out, but I'll skip it here because it comes up um, in multiple places. Um, also on the same page, um, the school bus stop comes up, which comes up um, in other places. And then Keith, you originally had 37 acres and you went down to 20. And um, I was just uh, wondering how we got there. In for the, we never had a 37 never acre. When, okay. When did we have a 37? It was an approximate, you did some math on a calculator. It was never well, right. I, I, I just so the, the, tw the 20 acres, which without, uh, which basically I wanted to hear public testimony, which we did here today, was to stop somebody, since we are allowing a variance, somebody with one acre could ask for a variance and clog up the system. So we were just trying to stop people that had absolutely no chance of getting a variance, or in our opinion, no chance. And we wanted to show the commission that that these are special circumstances uh, to to get a variance and not just haphazardly. It, it seemed like the consensus today was that we need to look at bumping it up. Yes, I think well, thirty and forty acres. So um, again, twenty this twenty acre was a starting point. We are um, we have lost time, and we're trying to. Uh, streamline things as quick as possible for the end of the year. But I, I do want to go back on your statements from Fish and Game. Uh, fish, and, fish and Game without seeing our CEQA can not make any claim that they're going to demand something more because they don't even know what we're going to give them. So that's a very disingenuous statement on their part that no matter what, unless they're just saying no matter what they do, they're going to come and attack Trinity County, which maybe is what they're going to do. My recollection is in the letter um, that they were saying that they were basing off the letter <coughs> off of the September 6th application on the website. I don't have the letter in front of me, but I can look it up, but I'm pretty sure that's what the letter said. Well, as, as Tom pointed out, they, they threw in everything in the kitchen sink that the county doesn't even have authority over. Uh, but we've, we hope we've spent, and, and to be clear, what Rick has done and Leslie has done when they hired the consultant to come in, this is all about this 500. And this work has been done, and, and uh, I have confidence to uh, a decent amount that this will mitigate all the issues that they have. And they will have an opportunity to comment once it's released. Uh, 
um, 1177, I would strongly encourage uh, looking at the cap. Mine aren't numbered like are you still on? Yeah, I'm look, on. You're looking at the previous? One, one, no, I'm on 3.2 public hearing today on the commercial cannabis ordinance. Okay, you're looking at the current, current ordinance. That's been yeah, presented. this is in our backup. It's not in, right, on this. Okay. So this is all in our backup. Uh, it would be negligent, excuse me for saying it wrong. Uh, we would be in error if we continued to think that we would have better public safety and economic uh, viability with the driver of this county being cannabis and also thinking we can change things environmentally by keeping the 500 count, and that comes up in, in a couple different places. The first time it comes up is on this page, so that's why I'm saying it there. Um, you have the North Coast Regional Water Quality uh, Control Board. I believe um, SB 94 is just uh, referring mostly now, not just to this, but to the Water Board, and there is going to be a shift. Um, you might want to put something in there in the language that as that changes, that we will change with it because it looks like the water board is the regional security. Well, we put both with them. Or we put more. Just, just going to read. Are we, that was done in October. Yeah. Okay. 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 If somebody is a farmer and they want to homeschool their child, um, they will be able to farm. Where, where is that? Point of order. We don't know this. Uh, we're, we're asking, where is, where is this? Uh, page 1181. It's 5A1. You don't know the page of the order. Well, I'm um, eight. Five. A1. All right. Well, you're, you're <coughs> A1. Got it. Okay. Within 1,000 feet. Uh, right. I, I don't believe. Uh, I don't believe homeschool is considered. Homeschooling is not considered a school. So. I don't, don't, don't tell my kids that, please. Well, I, <laughs> with no offense to your children. Yeah, he dropped out to go to school. Uh huh. He did. You know, let's keep it on track here. It is not considered school under our definition. Okay. And it would be on page five, letter U. And it would be under Euthoria facility. Please. Five what? The public park, school off right park. No, that would not fall. Okay. So it's clear. Okay, I think we have that last time. So she's actually looking at this document. Yes. Okay. Now we're to this document. Okay. So you talk about the school bus stop um, going back to SB 94. There is no bus stop zoning. We do know, and so the state <laughs> has not dropped their hundreds of pages of regulations that are going to come out. So each each department has not dropped them yet. Hopefully soon. Uh, so in there, there is talk in Sacramento that there will be a limit from the bus stop. But since we didn't want to have to open this up back and forth, back and forth to be compatible with the state, <laughs> we're just deferring to state and if the state doesn't have one then we won't have one either. Yes, that's what we're and that's all it says. We're not putting out any No. Just the state no. says a foot or a foot if they say a thousand. That was clear that the SB nine board doesn't have it, so the language 
language in there. But we're waiting on the regulation, I understand, to change everything. So the residency thing, um, I still have the same objections that I had to before. Uh, somebody buying um, a property or a, a shop or the newspaper, as soon as escrow is done, they are allowed to start. And it seems like, once again, cannabis is put into this unique situation where um, it's penalized. There are criminals doing bad activities that we need to make sure pay the full price if found guilty. And then there's a, there are people that are transitioning. And the people that are transitioning should be encouraged. And, and um, I just think that the, the residency uh, requirements as and also uh, limiting if someone is blessed to have a lot of properties in their names that they should not be limited. So with that, those are the final changes. The, uh, I, would, I would say that to take to not put the carve outs when they're already zoned, I agree with Mr. C all the way, that this is a private property right. I can understand how people in any community have strong feelings, but if we allow people to say no, then then what do you say to Pine and Post who all want want it? And so I just would caution you that when we stop using the community plans and the uh, ordinances and our general plan that we're, we're going down a road that, that we all get to decide. And I don't think that anybody in our community would want somebody else making those decisions. Are there any other questions? Not for me. Okay. Uh, can you take a break, though? Sure. We're going to break. It's 3.16. I think you lost. Um, uh, no. No. It's 316, 15 minutes, 330, 317. Come on. Well, it's 317. It's 332. Going to call the back into session. We had a great recess. Jungle bars are my favorite. I feel like chip. Uh, Supervisor Chad, uh, anything to come up while? No? I just got to make sure that the water district is put back in. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hey, it's, st it's still in there. No. Um, what do you mean? <coughs> the water district. So, what you, so it's in and out. What, what are you asking for? For the water district to be in the board. Yes, and that you put the 25 extra or however many people within the next six months apply. Speak in your microphone, please. No, we, we can't hear. That the water district in Hayford, water works district, is, is put back in with the option of the people to be able to go forward. They were eliminated from doing, requesting the NOIs because they thought they were out. We had a number of 25. I would simply ask that you ask for six months that they have time to apply and then cut it off. Is that clear? So the Waterworks District Number One will be. It was, you know, we had it available a month ago, so that's my confusion. There is no confusion. This is a request. I, I just want to be crystal clear. Absolutely. So the, the same thing that we had last time. So what we're doing. Now. Yeah, we had a 25 limit cap on the amount of applicants. Right. Now I'm saying instead of a number of applicants because they were not, a, they did not think they could go forward. So they haven't proceeded that we do a time frame instead of a, an amount. But I have no idea how many people, I think some people have actually moved. Understanding that they were supposed to have a water board license for the last two and a half years. Uh, there was a, a time limit at the time it was in, 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 in either 45 or 60 days. November to December, or October 15th to December. Okay, so page eight, uh, <coughs> five, and BI or six.
as is, correct? No. With the addition? No. She wants it removed from number six. Right. And then she would like an unlimited amount of license for six months. What? So the water district will be Available. Available. Okay. Okay. Kind of similar to what we had in the urgency, but different. Thank you, Bobby. I misunderstood. Yeah, we had testimony from people from Hayfork that they would like to do a community plan to bring it forward. The last two meetings. What about? Um, using one of the other two items, the uh, sewer district, which is a little smaller, or the airport safety area. I think if you give people six months, then they'll, you'll know it'll be done. Uh, but leave, leaving it as an exclusionary zone. But a smaller zone. Smaller, little saying. smaller zone. But the thing is, there up. is ag land in that area. Right. Excluded. Um, there is ag, there is ag land. In, a little bit of ag land in that area, and they can still request a waiver of variance. Okay. Um, so you want to leave, you want to remove the whole water district? I want to allow the people in the water district a time frame in which, if they want to cultivate cannabis, that they can become mm -hmm. compliant. Okay, right. and you wish to remove uh, the water district from the opt out or exclusion. Okay, got it. Uh, okay, thank you. I just the opposite. And you walked out. I, I thought you wanted to leave, leave the water district. Too, that's, that, that's why I was. Confused. I want the people in the water district to be able to grow cannabis. Right. And have it regulated by their R1, R2, or whatever. Correct. Right. Okay, got it. Thank you. I thought it was just the opposite, Bobby. That's why I was confused. Um, would you consider the uh, sewer district, which is smaller, a little bit smaller, still has some ag in it, and they'd have to get a variance, or the, uh, you know, the safety zone? I think the time limit will help decide on all that. If okay. they have ag land and we're taking that right away from them, then at least this gives them that option. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, requests? Board members, except me. Okay, yes, I do have some requests. Page eight. Um, applying for the type three D two or II um, it is only twenty acres. I would like to see that uh, around eighty acres, which is half of a. Uh, Quadrant. Well, so that would be half of a quarter. Yes, okay. And I'm willing to deal. Well, when I, when I send my motion, we can deal. I have a point of interest on that. Could you have an acre grow but split it between other properties? So if you have a fire, it doesn't why burn your whole you, property? Why don't you take a moment after the meeting or at some time during our lives and discuss that with planning? Thank you. Thank you. Kevin. Sorry. Okay. Was that it? I did make Okay. Uh, also, also the offset. Uh, well, I think the AE will take care of it. I was wondering about the offset for that being 350 feet. It's 500. 500. 500. Okay. Perfect. For that license. Perfect. Thanks for, for pointing my nose. Yeah, that's it.
available for uh, application if enrolled in the water board by 1231-17. Same type of, if not longer than we did for those other districts. And then um, uh, increase the uh, property acreage size for type three license um, up to, I was gonna go a little lower, up to 50 versus 20. Thank you. And I think that, that was it. Um, I have a motion on the table. Does anybody want to <coughs> second it? Just for clarification, you're adopting the proposed ordinance from the ad hoc committee, so all the changes that were discussed that were different from what was <coughs> proposed. Yeah. Um, well, I'm adopting what the Planning Commission had proposed in addition to the minor adjustments we did and then the slight minor adjustments. Just did. Is there any clarification? Yeah, does that, does that make sense? That make sense. Um, could you repeat your question for Supervisor Chapman? Oh, I apologize. My question was whether she, her motion to adopt was the uh, ad motion to adopt the ordinance with the changes that were uh, suggested by the Planning Commission and the changes that were suggested by Ad Hoc as well as the changes that were suggested today, or whether she wanted to go to the uh, ordinance that was presented to the Planning Commission without those changes. Sorry, that's what we received recommendations from the commission. Thank you. That's clear. And then what we added in today's fine tuning. Understood. So I have a motion on the table. Yes, you do. Do I have a second? Um, well, we have a problem with your motion, so we can either pull it back or we talk about it. Withdraw your motion. I'll withdraw it. What is? Well, the problem is you don't. You just open it up. You don't say if we're going to go to the 25 permits or if we're going to go to the time period or or if we're going to have unlimited. She gave a three month time limit instead of six months. Right, except that we already are full up on our 500 permits. Well, we don't know. The, well, we have I, 500 I, waiting. We have 500 waiting, but that's what I'm saying. 100. We wanted definite. to give 25 to that district because they were locked popped out. Do you want to direct staff also to start calling? Well, John, let's get this done. Uh, do you want to? Well, in your motion, do you want the? Do you want to start calling the, the pink cards? Well, those are already administratively in the works, and I think staff has have been getting caught up, and there's. We'll look at folks who are participating. Okay. That's already kind so of So you have started. confidence in staff? When the 25 come in, they will be added, unless I've lost correct, they will be added to the list as it exists today. The we did not add 25. They just be clear, the motion that was proposed did not add onto the cap of 500. It just right. allows those to become part of the waiting list, right. which likely no, that's, based on... That's not what I'm saying, because that's the motion. Right. That's, that was yeah, the motion. That's, that's yeah. not how I understood. She was opening it up. For, for 90 days, well, till the end, of December, December, the end of December, for those people that were cut out. And that's not the motion was to allow okay, so you an individual to have their water board license by November 30th, 2015, is now eligible to be exempt from that opt out. But they would still have to comply with all of the rules here, which includes the 500 cap. So the original, what we, and that's why I brought it, said it the way I did, right. because then to not interfere with the 500, it would go above the 500, however many come in in that area. That's how it's set up. Yes, it would be above the 500. If the list clears, then they roll into that group. Correct. Process it. Okay. So is that your question, Keith? Well, that's my question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's my question. If they're the 500, if, if we're just going to give unlimited numbers, then why would that? Request that they be non-transferable out of that district. These would be district. I, I don't want to be in a situation where 400 people yeah. get their license and then turn around and sell them to people out of the area. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So we can do. Um, 
Okay, I would go throw that language in versus I'm hearing from Supervisor Chadwick, she doesn't want a, a number a cap for that district. So I will um, reword the district, or the motion. Your pleasure how you want to proceed. The concern staff would have on not having a number, of course, is with our CEQA, because yes. we need to have a finite amount. If it's opened up generically for three months, we could get Right. Theoretically, enough that would that would require us to take a huge step back on our seat. So, um, I will similar motion, but add um, up to thirty, which is in addition to the five hundred. So the five hundred. Thirty like specifically for that district. District, right? Okay because of the secret issue, and that's why we had it limited last time mm -hmm. in August. So it sounds it's like once the secret's done, then you're going to open up the 500 Well, we'll see what CEQA, that has always been the issue, what CEQA's going to enlighten us on. I mean, they may say you're fine, they may say you're not, so that's been the issue that we've been discussing for a long time. So with that, um, so you have TC Waterworks 123117 with up to 30, right. and then um, Type 3 with the 50 acre minimum. Right. And then, um, otherwise, as is with inclusions for, uh, go ahead. Planning Commission and the, the ad hoc. And so that's it. 30 of 500 would be for Water County County District 1. So, like we did last time, I think this was your point. It was in addition to that 500. And Listen, I, we have a, we, you have a motion, so let's move forward. Thanks, Do I have a second? And I would. For discussion. Do I have a second? I have a. I you yes. just second your own. Yeah, I'm going to second my own. <laughs> For discussion, there are all sure the subsequent speaking. Yes. Thank you. Um, do I need to um, treat the type threes in the same way? Or are we going to? That's mm -hmm. something that just hit me. No, individuals who are the type you must already hold. That's true. The type that takes right. care of that other type, so that it is included in the fire right. right now. Okay. Then, um, then my motion stays the same, and her second stays the same. Okay. So, I got a little lost. Are we issuing 530 or are we issuing 530 of the same indicators? I already know. Look at it. Tomato, tomato. Well, it's not. Well, the way I have it written. License, yeah. 30 in the district. The way I have it written is that the county shall reserve 30 of the 500 permits for licenses within Trinity County Waterworks District 1. So, there's still a 500 cap and 30 of those are reserved for that district. That wasn't my understanding. It was That's 530 why I specifically on top of the 500, like the 25 was, but now we have. So we want five yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. That's correct. Mm -hmm. See. Any other discussion, or is there any other subsequent, or forward with anything? You want to change anything here? Yes, sir. You want to go home? <laughs> I have more than my say. Okay. Um, I'm over it. Um, I'll co call for the question. I mean, uh, I have the question. Let's uh, pull the board at this point, please. I don't want to upset anyone else by what I would have to say. <laughs> I'm, uh, it would be your district, so please. Thank before, you, you. before you call, oh. <laughs> I just want to remind the audience that this will be back before us in our next board meeting in October, so it's not completely finished. But we can't necessarily make any changes to it. Minor, Minor. please hold the board. Supervisor Chadwick? Yes. Supervisor Morris? Yes. Supervisor Groves? Aye. 
and Supervisor Fenley. Yes. <laughs> stuff I have constituents that are now upset at me, but what's new? I've heard from them before. Uh, it's 3.50, we have LAFCO in 10 minutes. What else do we have to do today? Report! We can. Okay, fine, I'll start out. Um, RCRC has their basket coming up, and I appreciate anything that anybody can start out to do the now. Uh, my other kind of travel, if anybody wants to pick this up. Uh, kind of travel. Please quiet down. <coughs> we still are in session. And Keith will be our bouncer next year. Yes, I know you're busy. Uh, I have not had any other camps travel, thank you. Who wants to go next? I'll just say LCC, we met and um, we have an opening at the High Income School for like a Head Start situation and we need to recruit. Um, EMS was last week, I did that. And um, they are talking about um, doing going away from how they're set up now as a JPL and Conca and going, moving into a different direction. So, so you know, there's was a lot of discussion. So you're going to want to get caught up. A lot of that is at 12.50, I believe. Or maybe 12. No. Shh. I just was up uh, back and forth to really Junction City. I canceled some other meetings because of the fire issues. Yeah, I wasn't out of county, but I will announce publicly that I was challenged uh, by a a complaint under FPPC that I wasn't uh, allowed to do marijuana. Uh, FPC, P, FPPC uh, found that claim to be not even worth investigating, so I stay on. Okay. Well, I'm a bottle of wine outside or something. That's a conflict of interest. <laughs> you know, Jake, how many times have you been kicked out? None. None. Not you asked me once and I told you I was all set. Okay, thank you. Uh, did department heads want to report out about anything? Yeah. Really, Rick? Yeah, I want to. It's important. <laughs> Sorry. So, I want to let everybody know that there is a Helena Fire Recovery page. Its uh, link is at the very front of the Trinity County webpage, so you can select on it. It has all the press releases and it has some pertinent information on there uh, if you're affected by the fire that you can get um, and, and start filling out forms and stuff. Uh, one of the things, there is a, a debris removal meeting on uh, Thursday at uh, 6 o'clock at the elementary school, so in Junction City. So we uh, advise you if you lost either an outbuilding or a primary residential unit that you uh, attend that meeting and find out how a uh, Cal Recycle is proposing to come in and initiate cleanup. Letty did announce this morning. Also, okay, is thank it, you. That's good. Is the CAO reporting out? Nothing for that now. Okay. Uh, members of the ad hoc committees, does anybody want to report out on anything? Well, it's... Uh, like the cur commercial the cannabis ordinance? Um, <laughs> no, on the legislation side, uh, at 2 in the morning, Saturday legislation wrapped up with the trailer bills. We're still waiting on the emergency regs. Um, nothing totally earth shattering out of that that we didn't know that came out on Saturday. Okay. That's Thank all you. I have on the legislation. Any, any other ad hocs want to report out? Well, uh, the uh, permanent ordinance, we do have that still. Um, we still have the, the labs coming soon. October. October 3rd. Uh, we have nurseries going back to the commission once more. And then, and then we have manufacturing that will be going to the commission for a first reading at their next meeting. Uh, I will say that we've been uh, delayed by this process uh, significantly, so we're going to have to try to paddle very hard to get these licenses up by the first of the year, all of them. We're on track to do that now. I'm not so sure that it's where we're at. Okay. Um, thank you, Keith. Is 
there anything else? Okay. Um, let's adjourn this meeting and move on to our LAFCO, your LAFCO meeting. We do have one. Do we have a closed session? No. Yeah, we do. Well, there you go. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.